Welcome to Kurt Vonnegut's, the podcast dedicated to the life and works and ongoing things of Kurt Vonnegut because he's the greatest author of all time. My name is Alex Schmidt, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Michael Swaim. Ah, ha, 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 ha. God, we're funny. <laughs> what? We were saying a bunch of funny stuff before, right before we started taping, and I just want credit for it. So, oh, good call. Yeah, yeah. It was. I'm trying good. to simulate the laughter, the good old buddy laugh that we all just had in the room a second ago. <laughs> Bring that energy into the episode. <laughs> yeah, that actually, it reminds me a little bit of that new after hours you guys did, where it opens with the end of a Coen Brothers episode, and then yeah. other stuff happens, and we never get. It's great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great plug. <laughs> New cast, killing it. Yeah, and old cast still killing it, still doing it. And not the focus of this show. <laughs> yeah, this show is about Kurt Vonnegut and the other things I said. And yeah. this week's book is Dead Eye Dick. Yeah. Dead Eye Dick is a book mm -hmm, from 1982. Mm -hmm. It's a novel. And uh, we're going to get way, way into it. I think we can go straight into a segment called Plot Time. Plot Time is tick, appropriate tick, tick, tick. for this one. The last one was Palm tick, Sunday. Tick, tick, tick. Didn't have as much of a through line. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, we're fresh off we're our back to novels. We're fresh off our hot live show too at the last bookstore. It now was we're hot back in the studio. Everyone there was so hot. <laughs> right, sexually hot. That's what I meant. Yeah. Whoa. That's not what I meant at all. <laughs> you really made that weird. But yeah, it was a great book, man. Have you read this one before? I had not read it before. Yeah. I read it once when I was little and didn't get it at all. So it felt like I never read it before. Yeah, yeah. What's your first blush hot well, take, I, takeaway? Because also reading it within the framework we've been reading them in, where we're going book by book through all of Kurt Vonnegut's work, it felt like an extension of Breakfast of Champions Absolutely. in just about every way. It's, yes. it's building out on, I kept in my notes, I kept calling it the breakfast verse. You know, like it'll be the Whedon verse or something. It was like this sounds whole book's delicious. in the breakfast verse. Yeah. Right, which is a galaxy of foods, it sounds uh, like. It's yeah, great. big fluffy blueberry pancakes. <laughs> then you get sick of it. It's like, that's too bad. You're in the breakfast verse. All there is is pancakes. <laughs> yeah, Twilight Zone. <laughs> it's not fair. Speaking of unfairness, what another downer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I do agree. It felt very much like a spiritual twin. And then as you read it, a literal like Tarantino-esque extension of the Breakfast of Champions universe. Yeah, like everybody's a Vega brother or whatever in Everybody. Tarantino versus this book. Whereas he tends to reuse characters in the past, and I'm sure we'll talk about it more in depth in the character section, but this one was interesting for being like, well, none of these people are the people, but they're all related to the people. Yeah, he did that yeah. more than he's ever done it before. Like you said, yeah, it's not Vincent Vega again, but it's his brother is in this <laughs> book. So, yeah, you'll get a lot of names you recognize from, like, uncles, nephews, descendants. And, of course, the hero, quote, unquote, of Breakfast of Champions, Dwayne Hoover, a huge off-camera or off-book presence in this, but yeah, he doesn't ever yeah. appear. He, he he shows up a little bit. He shows up in the jail at one point, and, and there's a few other brief spots, but yeah. it, it's very in passing. Like he's very background. Is he physically ever in a scene? I thought he just gets yeah. talked about. Okay, okay. But only rarely. But he's like yeah. the shadow figure. Yeah, and, like, and Celia Hoover, his wife, is in it a lot, where in Breakfast of Champions she's dead. You know, it's sort of yeah. playing with people who we... And also it felt strange that because in breakfast of champions kurt explicitly promises i am letting my characters go and we know kilgore trout has already come back a mm -hmm. bit in books after that but this one he really throws that out that was just a check it's his like, butt eh. couldn't cash that was like a, <laughs> a new year's resolution he thought he was gonna keep and then he was like yeah i can't do that yeah, like, come, on, uh, come on what am i gonna do yeah so it sounds like you liked it i always like to get that out of the way up top dude was it a good read for you i loved it it was uh relative to kurt fine but oh. so it was good, you know, like I like Kurt Vonnegut books and they're good. But I love, relative to him, it's all right, you know. Yeah. As we do this, I'm also starting to get a feel, like I can kind of predict what you'll like and what I'll like. I loved it. Like it's up there with Sirens and Breakfast for me now. It's in the top tier, absolutely top tier. Wow. Top draw. <laughs> oh, wow. I wouldn't go that far, but that's cool. Well, yeah. all the ones that about crippling depression, <laughs> I really like. I'm such a sucker for like, Yeah. And it's funny because, some, yeah, I'll see a really depressing movie and be like, that wasn't that good. I just took it more seriously because it was about something sad, you know? <laughs> Nicholas Sparks' his whole career. Let's dive into this plot, shall we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and speaking of characters recurring or coming back, with all these Vonnegut books, we keep finding that 
the preface or the intro has something interesting. The quotes before it have something really, really, and I shouldn't even say interesting. I should say like crucial, like it's uh, structural. Mm -hmm. And then this one, I think, goes the earliest it possibly can with like Vonnegut fun content uh, stuff because there's a joke copyright in it. The book is copyrighted to the Ramjack Corporation. Did not notice that. (laughs) Which I didn't know legally you could do that. Ramjack is the big corporation from Jailbird, the previous novel we did. And the book is officially copyrighted to them uh, if you look in the front of it. It's bonkers. So I wonder if he had like an LLC form just for that joke. He, I would hope because otherwise I don't otherwise, know how you get any money. How could you enforce the copyright for real when it becomes time to do that? Yeah. <laughs> right. Like I hope he didn't set it up so this one book is floating like outside of yeah. his intellectual property and rights. Like, There's still it's like just out there. <laughs> one college intern in a cubicle in Tampa who like keeps Ramjack going for maintenance <laughs> purposes so they can keep collecting money on this book. <laughs> yeah, which is like weirdly right for Ramjack. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, they own the world, dude. Well, I guess after. Slacker yeah, after like Jailbird. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I noticed this about all his books now in retrospect, but since we're talking about the beginning stuff, this book has one of the more pronounced sections of reviews. Mm. And what I realized that's so funny to me is there are reviews you'll recognize from every Vonnegut book. And they get longer as his canon goes on. When you say reviews, you mean like at the, the front of it, there blurbs. were quotes from... Okay, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've got an old hardcover and it doesn't have that. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, in the recent... Ad- the, I got the like most recently published edition I could find. Yeah. And I will say it's very common in Vonnegut to have like 10 pages up front of praise for Vonnegut. He's our greatest black humorist. We laugh <laughs> in self-defense. Uh, and then like praise for Dead Eye Dick in particular. Yeah. And I got to wonder as we learn more about him if he had something to do with that. Because, like, he really cared about his reviews. He and did. if he got good ones, I want, I could see him, like, clipping them out and being like, that one's going in. <laughs> yeah, I could kind of see that. Because, yeah, a lot of, especially a lot of, if I have, like, a newer trade paperback or something, a lot of them have on the cover of it a general, very positive thing about, Kurt, like, like one. George Orwell and Dr. Caligari mm-hmm. and Flash Gordon had a baby and it was Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> and that's not, like, the front of the book for some reason. He, maybe he maybe he loves it. Maybe he pushed for it. Yeah. Yeah. The book's also dedicated to Jill. It's just a very simple for Jill. That's Jill Kremitz, his second wife, who he married in 1979. So he's fully married to her when this book comes fully out. Fully married. Full full marriage. Full stop. I'm a scholar of marital law. And <laughs> one maritime marital law. One time <laughs> was it which what was the other one he dedicated to her? Palm Sunday or Jailbird? Where he said she chronicled me. I just yeah, guess, yeah. like, but I guess between this book and that book, she didn't chronicle oh. him anymore because she just gets a poor Jill. <laughs> it's Juan Peter's Foma and Grand Balloons. Gotcha. Yeah. She yeah. Cr- that's the one she chronicled him for. Yeah. But yeah, nice, simple. I was glad to get right into the story. He can't. Yeah. He can't withstand having a preface, and the preface is a doozy. Yeah, but it's shorter sure. than they usually are. This one actually has a lot of meat in the story. It's pretty focused. Yeah, and it's not ep- epilogue either. It just kind of gets to it, yeah, and and puts it all yeah. in the book. Now, although I'll argue when we get to the last chapter, which I think is 26 or 27, I made a note where it's like, who are you fooling? This is an epilogue. You just didn't call it epilogue. Yeah, like, I also, it should, I, I actually, it is called an epilogue in mine, but it doesn't feel like so extra and ancillary and Kurt's voice right back in, you know? It's just the story wraps up like a story. Oh, yeah. yeah. But I mean, I have the little section called epilogue, but I I would argue, and I will when we get there in plot time, that the chapter before that is also an epilogue. And he just was yeah. like, I don't want the epilogue to be so long. And he chopped it in half. <laughs> Called one half the epilogue. Ah, self-conscious Kurt. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, So what jumped out of you uh, as far as all the beans he spills in the preface? As we find with these, Kurt is usually very direct about all his meanings. And it jumped out to me that there's a chunk toward the end of the preface where he's just like, these are what all the metaphors mean. He literally says, I will explain the main symbols in the book. And then just does that. And I think this one, I don't know if I've looked too much into his life or, or it's... I don't know what it is in my head that I struggle with, but I feel like this book, he might have gone too far in the direction of literally recounting his life through these thin metaphors. And it might have helped him more to focus more on the most exciting plotting or the most interesting storytelling versus trying to capture some... I think I ran into the same thing with Slapstick, which also you liked more than I did. Also I loved, yeah. Like I felt like he was a little bit trying to do some kind of performance art about his life in some places where I would rather he just did the story and stuck to making the characters as interesting as possible. 
Well, in case you haven't read it and you're wondering <laughs> whether to read it, I do disagree. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it needs any help. I think it's a oh, flawless great. masterpiece. Yeah, yeah. And I love that he says, I will now explain the main symbols in this book. <laughs> Beca- and they don't only inform this book, like they deeply illuminated Breakfast of Champions for me as well. And that's amazing. Yeah. So like the Mildred T. Berry Art Memorial museum that was you know the central location of the climax of breakfast of champions he now reveals that represents my head yeah (laughs) it's my head and the things inside are the thoughts i'm having in my inner dialogues and things about that that's where i house my thoughts about art and my inner debates about that yeah and like that doesn't just affect this book it affects the breakfast verse it's amazing right he says there's going to be a neutron bomb that depopulates an area that represents going home and everyone you knew is either changed or gone now yeah. Interesting side note, that's what Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg say The World's End is about. Oh. You go home and sense. everyone's so different and the culture's so different, they may as well be aliens or robots. Cool. Yeah, you I go really back like to your hometown. Movie. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. it's a good one. And then he says, the neutered pharmacist who tells the tale, our hero, Rudy Waltz, is my declining sexuality and the crime he committed in his childhood is any bad things I have done, all the bad things I have done. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think that's it from the preface for me, but like... If you go forward knowing those four main symbols, you don't even need to take this in school. Like, it teaches itself. <laughs> right. Right. It's, it's amazing. It's like if Lord of the Flies was like, look, preface, Piggy is this, Simon is this. Right. Yeah, it's it's about society. You get <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah. Anyway, here it is. <laughs> you can skip it, honestly. It's pretty downery. <laughs> yeah. It also, one other thing I want to pick out when he's talking about the main symbols, he says that specifically the empty art center is his head as his 60th birthday beckons to him, which mm-hmm. is a pretty direct parallel to breakfast, because breakfast, he says at the beginning, like, my 50th birthday is coming. I'm trying to flush out my head for 50. And yeah. so this is, apparently he's very decade oriented. He's like, I need to do that again in kind of the same place this time. And it might be important to note that in Breakfast of Champions, it is a bustling art facility that ends up the site of like a brawl that then yields to enlightenment. And in this, it's an abandoned wreck with nothing inside it that no one has visited in a while. Right. So I don't know if he's trying to say something about how he feels from his 50s to his 60s, (laughs) but it's grim. (laughs) Yeah, because also I think it's in the preface. He also says that the neutron bomb in his book is it operates on the logic of people who think we can win a nuclear war and not on the logic of actual nuclear bombs. So it's a bomb that eliminates all the people from a space but leaves all the buildings standing and as a kind of ghost town which is not realistic but he's saying oh this is the specific metaphor i want so it really is a fully standing completely abandoned building yeah he fact checks ahead of time like he says i'm gonna do this with the creole language it's mildly problematic which i give him points for like recognizing about himself and he's like i'm not trying to simplify the like complexity of creole the narrator is just beginning to learn creole and is dumb and doesn't understand so like i'm going to present creole as if it sounds dumb and there's only a present tense but that's because you're hearing it through rudy's ears and i'm like i'm glad he went out of his way to say that <laughs> yeah and then yeah he says like there's going to be stuff i say that's not true i'm not dumb i know a neutron bomb blows shit up i'm pretending that the wishful thinking that inventors who are working on the neutron bomb had worked yeah so it's almost like a jetson's view of what nuclear war was gonna be like when we we're <laughs> like oh it'll be fine yeah Yeah, we'll all just move to the clouds or whatever. Right, exactly. (laughs) Crank the house up. (laughs) And then last but not least, God, we're almost to stuff happening, guys. You know how Vonnegut rolls. Yeah. But last but not least, there's an opening quote before we get to the plot as well. Sure. His father, Otto Waltz, and he gives his birth and death dates. Yeah, the main character's father. Yes. Sorry, not Kurt Vonnegut's father. But you're right, it is so autobiographical. I kept just thinking of... Yeah. It is his father and his, you know, Celia is obviously his mother and stuff like that. And I, and I think the whole book in particular is really driven by Kurt's real life relationship with his father, Kurt Vonnegut Sr. Like it's really who he was frustrated with in a lot of ways. Oh, I don't know anything about that relationship. I'm so excited to hear what you brought. Yeah. But the quote is, who is Celia? What is she that all her swains commend her? And I crossed it out and wrote swains. But other than that, (laughs) that is a a misquote of a line from the Iliad about Helena Troy, and it'll come up later. Yeah. It's also, that's the, what, second or third Swain in Vonnegut? Because there were Swains as a last name and Slapstick, and now here we go. 
Good sign. So you know close. it's going to be a good one. A letter away. Yeah. But uh, I do think it sets up the, uh, and something we've already touched on just before we even get to the plot, which is, I think that's one of the main themes of the book, is how what you expect your life to be differs from what it turns out to be. Yeah. And uh, we'll say why. So I think that's why that quote is enshrined there, because it's one of the key moments of the book where you're like... This is not going as planned. This <laughs> yeah. is all just falling apart. Yeah. This is not great. We'll get to it. I it's can funny. see it happening. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, chapter one kicks off with a lot of um, a metaphor I really like. The first line is to the as yet unborn, to all innocent wisps of undifferentiated nothingness, watch out for life. And then from there, we're working from the perspective of Rudy Waltz, who's the main character, and he talks a lot about life being a sequence of peepholes opening and closing. So all of us are looking through a peephole that opens when we're born and closes when we die. And that's just the process of being alive is suddenly this peephole's open and you have to deal with it. And then eventually it won't be open anymore. Yeah, and the important function about the peephole is that when it opens, facts pour in and you cannot appeal them. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so like it is this great device and we won't pause to examine every literary device he uses that's so great. But he uses this yeah. one repeatedly throughout. And it's basically like he'll say like so-and-so's people opened and voices told them you're white. Lucky that you were born white. And it's like, okay, I guess I'm white. There's no changing it. <laughs> yeah. And it's an interesting way to think about life. Yeah, it's basically I didn't ask to be born this yeah. way or in whatever circumstance. Well, and I also and I wanted to stop for it because I think it might be my favorite thing about the book. Is yeah, the people completely. concept. Yeah, yeah, it's really the way he plays with it and the way he uses it is and just as an overall thing, it's great. Sure. It's really like good. how for you slapstick is like the name system. Is the pull oh, out yeah. best thing by yeah, far? Yeah. yeah, it's fantastic. That makes sense. I love a lot about the book, and the peepholes are one of the best things for sure. Yeah, and we we also learn uh, more about Rudy. He tells us that he's age fifty. He's in Midland City, which is in Ohio. It was yeah. it, the city was in Indiana in Breakfast of Champions, and now it's in Ohio in this book. Which is well, if you're familiar clip. with the film Rudy, that's not helpful for this discussion. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Notre Dame is yeah. in Indiana. Well, he starts by talking about his parents. Right. And then is going to get to the birth of him and his brother and tell their life in order. And uh, the th basic things you should know about their family, they're wealthy. They're wealthy because they inherited money. There's some Money River, you know, vibe there. Yeah. And it's especially ironic, I guess, because his dad, Otto, thinks of himself as a great artist, despises capitalism, and his family, who are rich from the pharmaceutical business, he just goes to meetings and disrupts things and calls them capitalist pigs. And he inherits all the money anyway. Like, he gets to be rich anyway. They basically have drug dealer money. Be right, right. Because right. their family got rich selling St. Elmo's Remedy, which was just snake oil made with heroin and cocaine in it, opium and cocaine. Yeah, just all the drugs. And yeah. that you, so like, <laughs> and a huge theme in this book is crime and punishment and how random it is, what sins are punished in this life and what are not. And if you think there's a moral structure that means karma, it's almost saying, nah, there's no karma. Because like, yeah. otherwise, how can you explain that some guys sell weed on the corner and go to jail for life? My whole family is their entire expenses for generations comes from the fact that my ancestors sold opium and heroin. Yeah. No one gives a shit. No one was ever punished. It's not a problem. And society respects my family for having money. We're like <laughs> right. high status. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible. Right. Our house is the destination in town. And yeah, we're, yeah. we're the people. When the Roosevelts come to town, they visit <laughs> our house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He also talks about how uh, his dad, Otto Waltz, was kind of an art student but also just kind of a son of a rich family and jerk uh who wasn't very good at art and was mostly uh he took up with an art teacher named august gunther and gunther was not really a very good art teacher and he and otto just went around going to whorehouses and pretending to be artists and drinking and hanging out took him on trips to europe saying you know i'm going to take him to see all the finest art in venice parents why don't you pay our way and then they would just like use prostitutes and drink yeah so you get the image of like maybe he had an iota of artistic talent ever maybe but it's kind of implied no he never even really did yeah and he just gets hooked up with this like crusty old bad grandpa type guy <laughs> and it ruins <laughs> him grandpa. Like, yeah. forevermore, he is basically an alcoholic hipster poser. Like, they, t they make a point of saying when he's, like, in Europe 
tooling around pretending he's an artist, he's still getting huge sums of money from home, and he dresses in rags, and in his mind, he thinks that's cool because he thinks it's like a costume party, and he's come as an artist, and artists are poor. Yeah. And it's like, what a hipster. That's just like, to me, the definition of fucking hipster poser bullshit, dude. I bet yeah, he had absolutely. a little goatee and shit. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yeah. So he gets caught because he gets gonorrhea. Comes back one time with gonorrhea. <laughs> <laughs> Which is always a fun moment. In yes. A book. Is that before or after they meet Hitler? It's before. Before Hitler. I mean, he bounces around, so I think he's saying, you know, <clears throat> six months later, he would. this would happen to him, but now I'm meeting Hitler. Yeah. But um, just chronologically in the book, we find out he'll eventually get gonorrhea from a prostitute, August Gunther will be fired, and then his parents' house will mysteriously burn down, and people will suspect August Gunther, but nothing will ever be proven. Yeah. Then... He goes on to say, yeah, why do, what is his father doing in Europe? Please enlighten us. Yeah, because in the, in the preface, Vonnegut says there will be four real painters in the book, and one of them is Adolf Hitler. Or By real painters, I mean people who lived in real life and painted. Uh, he's not saying Hitler's an amazing artist. No, no, you honored Adolf oh, Hitler boy. with the title painter. Oh, I think oh, that's important. Shut it down. <laughs> Episode over. Oh, boy. So he, uh, at one point, Otto is at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna because they're trying to just clean him up in Europe. And, and get him to be more respectable, so they send him off there. And the teachers there say that Otto and Adolf Hitler are both terrible artists, and they both kind of stick up for each other and then decide to become best friends because Otto tries to show up the teacher by being like, oh, you say this guy Adolf's a bad artist? Here's all my money for his painting. Aha. See, right. He's, he's a trying a pretty artist. woman. He's like, surprise, I'm actually a rich douchebag, yeah. and I'll pay a million dollars for this painting that's not very good. Yeah. Doesn't that show you? And it's like, no. <laughs> You're like a dumb kid, dumb rich kid, asshole. Get out of here. Yeah. And yeah. then they carouse around Vienna for a bit. and then Just because they... they commiserate over both being rejected from art school yeah yeah and then uh, and then Otto goes back to America but with Hitler's friendship long before yes. Hitler becomes a guy and so then when Hitler's rising in Germany throughout that time Otto's like I know a head of state how about that it's pretty cool and as you know if you're passingly familiar with American politics at that time there was a period before 1936-37 where as he says later in the book he we're gonna end up hanging a giant Nazi flag from our house <laughs> And it yeah. was only as offensive as, like, hanging a giant flag of Cuba if your family comes from Cuba. Like, no one associated right. it with death camps yet. Um, yeah, it was just a country that right. was changing around. And he, and, but he's like, what a big mistake. Like, <laughs> isn't that crazy? My dad, not only like we talk about in time travel shows, my dad not only could have strangled Hitler, but I'm pretty sure he told a story where there was like an especially bitter winter where Hitler was broke and had to live in a shitty place with no heating and had no winter coat. Yeah. And my dad bought him a winter coat. <laughs> he could have died of pneumonia. My dad might have saved Hitler's life, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, and that's, and I say that not to point out not to say my dad's a monster, but to say that's how fucked up, like, the peephole system is. And he says that's one of my main objections to life. You can make such terrible mistakes while alive. Isn't it crazy that – because, of course, once – the Holocaust starts happening. His dad, like, quietly backs off of that opinion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's not nuts. He's like, oh, I am now seeing some evidence that I shouldn't have been friends with this guy. Right. But he's one of the later people to do that in the country because he was already friends with him. So just when initial bad things were happening that weren't the Holocaust, he was like, ah, you know, he's a guy. Yeah. You yeah. Know. And then he backs off. <laughs> so he just thinks everything's fun. The war breaks out and he asks if he can join the Hungarian <laughs> side. And they're like, that side is against the allies what are you talking about and he's like well they have a really cool uniform with a felt hat and a uh, panther yeah. skin it, uniform it's like the hungarian lifeguard he's it's like, a very special unit in the hungarian military it's like i just want that uniform i have connections do you know who my parents are <laughs> like put me in that unit and some literally the american ambassador summons him in <clears throat> vienna and it's like you have to go home i called your parents they're gonna cut your money off we don't just get out of here, dude. Like World yeah. War Two is breaking out. You're lucky I care enough to send you home. You want to get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he goes home. 
Yeah. And also, and we should say as the way the book frames all this early stuff is this is from Rudy's perspective, very late in life when he and his brother Felix are running a hotel in Haiti, which they bought with some yeah. money they got from a lawsuit. And so they're looking back on it. They also have a servant named Hippolyte Paul de Mille, who says that he knows voodoo and can raise a ghost from the dead if they ever need that. And they're like, ah, you're crazy. Although and the narrator Vonnegut, as he sometimes does, explicitly says it is true, though. Like yeah. in the world of the book, he does have magic powers. They work. Yeah, for and sure. you just have to believe it because the narrator is telling you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, and uh, and one other thing Rudy is doing is mixing in recipes from his life, starting and it's about thirty pages in in mind, but he just starts interspersing into the action of the book and describing things, just straight up recipes. He says, hey, this is Mary Hubler's cornbread. This is how it's made. This is how I made a dessert. And he just keeps doing that throughout the book. And every single one has a tiny detail in it that is a poignant clue or implies a scene that otherwise wouldn't be there. And that's, I think they're used so well. And it really is yeah. oblivit, a term he coined to describe Palm Sunday. It's like an assault on all your senses because when you're reading the recipes, you can't help but imagine how it tastes and smells and stuff and then you'll get to the end and realize that this is called like Mama Maritimo's chocolate spumante and you go oh that implies all these scenes that aren't in the book where he got to know the Maritimo brother's mom so well that she taught him how to make her favorite old thing from Italy yeah. it's like it's a beautiful technique I love it so yeah there's like eight recipes throughout and That's I cool. each one has little clues in it I found or I or I'm imagining them no, I hadn't quite found that takeaway, but you're right, I think. Yeah, I, I had mostly read it as sort of like how in other books he'll talk about how life makes no sense, but music is holy. And so that's yeah. it, just because what it is is undeniably powerful. And I thought he was – my 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 takeaway was he was just kind of saying that about food as the book th was going I'm sure on. he is, yeah. But I, I, but I had not caught – quite there are a lot of a lot of the recipes kind of indicate scenes where he's living alone cooking for himself a lot or where he's part of other families and i right, hadn't thought of it yeah. that way that's like, really cool the point where he talks about there will be a huge tragedy and my parents who were you will become broke and they were used to having servants their whole lives and from this day forward this is the morning that i become their domestic servant for the rest of my life they will never wash a dish or cook a meal i will do it all because we can't afford servants but they're high class and they don't do that and yeah. this is that scene it's that morning that i realized oh shit now i'm your maid <laughs> and then it cuts to eggs a la rudy waltz and it just says the instructions and in, tell you how to make like a good baked egg dish and then at the end it, the instructions include and then the person who made it also cleans it up, washes the dishes, and puts the dishes away. Yeah, and so, like, yeah. every recipe right. definitely has a punch to it. There's a reason they're there, for sure. That's a really cool read. Yeah, it's great. So, when Otto comes home from the war, their house has burned down, as we said. Somewhere in there, someone yeah. burned their house down. The old, the old money yeah. kind of mansion family home thing. Right. So, now they live in this crazy cribs place. <laughs> yeah, because I think, if I remember right, it's the... One part of the house that hadn't burnt down was like a barn or a stable or something. It was a carriage house. Carriage house. It was it. like your garage, but it was, if you can imagine, he said it's like large enough to hold six carriages with horses attached to them, yeah. idling in there for when you want to go out. <laughs> so it's yeah. like Jay Leno's garage, but for horses and carriages. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, there was a Phaeton, there was a buckboard. Leno. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, and so they they turn that into their home. They make that into, it's kind of an art studio and kind of a home. And Otto moves in there with his wife, Emma. And uh, they're both still very high-class, well-to-do people in town, mainly because they just both come from money. And, and so dumb luck. His dad, like, invested in something, and then it went well. Which yeah. he makes the point to say is, and my dad doesn't know anything. Like, it just worked out. Yeah. <laughs> very <I know>. Vonnegut. <laughs> just the money moved, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, they introduce a couple other characters, his brother Felix, yeah. who from the very first is described as like his main trait is that his voice is awesome. <laughs> He's called the Velvet Fog a la Mel Torme, and that his whole life will be defined by the random fact that his people open and he had an amazing voice. Like he'll become a famous broadcaster and then the president of NBC, yeah. he will lead his men into war and become a war hero, literally because people hear his voice. And they're like, promote that man. <laughs> and that's an interesting aspect of life. And then the last, I'm going to call it a character, is the guns or the gun. Like, yeah. he introduces already looming over the story. And I think he's already said at this point, by the end of the book, I will be a notorious double murderer named Dead Eye Dick. 
And uh, he says, the last thing you should know about our house, well, two things, I guess. The kitchen, which I'll let you talk about, I guess. And then uh, the attic is filled with guns, a gun collection. And my dad would take us shooting. And as you'd expect, like, teens to do, as we grew up, we would take the guns out, sneak them out, and, like, shoot at cans and shit and shoot birds. And the guns will come into play. (laughs) Yeah, he has Otto doing kind of a speech to visitors about how my sons have been raised with guns. And because they've been raised with guns, they respect them and they think they want to. And in the meantime, Rudy says, yeah, uh, Felix would just take him out and shoot stuff with his friend. They were just they were just dicks. They weren't like cool. about Yeah. (laughs) One time we were getting bullied after school and he totally Stephen Kinged it and pulled a gun out of his waistband and made them leave and was like, (laughs) this isn't Stranger Things. Get the fuck out. Yeah. He was and fooling around so yeah the point is at the same time that he's saying well my kids know how dangerous guns are that's why they treat them with respect he's like no we didn't we really enjoyed shooting the guns (laughs) (laughs) willy-nilly and you mentioned the kitchen the family has full-time staff serving serving them Uh, one of them is a cook named Mary Hubler so that's the there's Hubler is established as a name last name mainly among poor black people in Breakfast of Champions and then she's a poor black person who's a servant to the family in this but. You can assume it has some relation to Wayne Hubler, I, I would imagine, if, yeah. if distant yeah, um, I mean, from yeah. breakfast. yeah. And Rudy finds that the servants are kind of more of a family to him than his parents, especially because they leave for Europe for a time when he's very young. And so he's sort of raised by them and feels very at home with them and at home serving people. It's a classic situation I think you see a lot where his rich parents are super aloof and like distant as evidenced and this has been done in other movies or book other books and movies where their house is giant. You know, it's the Citizen Kane effect and that's a symbol for like they themselves are vast empty spaces certainly. And then the servants and I think he does a good job of not romanticizing like it's he points out how shitty it is that the only yeah. people doing productive work are all crammed in this tiny hot room. And then the people who do nothing and have no reason to even be alive anymore just lounge in the giant space. Yeah. But he loves the kitchen smells. He loves the boisterousness. And he thinks it shaped a lot of his personality. And Mary Huber gets the most recipes in the book. And he talks about how one of his favorite things in life is cooking a meal. So I feel like there's hints there that, like, Mary is more of his mother figure than his mother ever was. For sure. His mother is, like, a, by the way, like a, a vacant trophy wife that his dad started grooming to be his wife when she was, like, 12. It's one of those creepy old-fashioned yeah, really romances. <laughs> yeah. So she's, like, a trophy wife who is... Has no thoughts because her whole life has been prescribed and she's not allowed to have any thoughts or ambitions. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so his parents do uh, get themselves together for basically just big show offy kind of things. Like Otto is always pretending to work on one painting in the middle of the house. And then also this story gets into Felix having a prom date with Celia Hildreth, who will eventually Mm -hmm. become Celia Hoover and married to Dwayne Hoover. But it's 1943 and he brings her over before prom. And their parents fill the house with candles, like way, way too many candles. And Otto, I believe, is dressed up in his Hungarian lifeguard military uniform, which Mm -hmm. is all like crazy furs and sashes and stuff. And then he does the quote from the before the book's action started about Celia and her swains. And it basically just freaks Celia out. She thinks it's crazy. Rightly so. Yeah. Basically, uh, Felix couldn't get a date, so he asks out a girl that no, who's considered the most beautiful girl in town, Celia, but no one wants to date her because she's so, like, quiet or dumb or difficult. Yeah. And it turns out that she's just saddled with a lifelong clinical depression that will eventually lead to her suicide, and no one's helping her out with that, so she's, like, a pretty bitter person. Yeah. And because she's so pretty, the only thing dudes have ever wanted from her is, like, sex or to court her. And she just hates men, hates society, doesn't understand why she was born this way. And then this rich dude tries to impress her by picking her up in a Rolls Royce. And she's bitterly poor. Picking her up in a Rolls Royce and taking her to her parents' house to meet his parents. And her dad comes out dressed in a panther skin yeah, and, like, in her mind, basically recites Shakespeare accusatorily because he's been overhearing that she's the prettiest girl in town and has become obsessed with the idea like he keeps calling her Helen of Troy so he's saying she comes in and he goes like I think he says like where is this beauty the greatest of all the face that launched a thousand ships step forward and take the apple from my hand if you dare (laughs) and he thinks he's doing like a fun bit but to her it is just insanity as you would 
think it would be. She doesn't know what the apple from the Iliad is a reference to. <laughs> like, that's insane that he expected her to. <laughs> and she screams and runs away and right. is not seen again by Felix for many years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they tell you it'll be, I think, 27 years later and after all the events of the book have happened, pretty much. Rudy will see her several more times. In fact, she stars in his play later. Yeah. Um, but Felix, yeah, completely ditches out. And then we skipped over, I realized, the Maritimo brothers, or Maritimo? How'd you say it in your head? Oh, Maritimo. Okay. Okay. How are we going to do this? <laughs> <laughs> no, all then. So the Maritimo brothers yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. are introduced. And I did you get a Sacco and Vanzetti vibe? Well, they're because their family is in Breakfast of Champions as like gangsters. And then in this book, I think they're a much friendlier, more regular family to me. They're like the heroes to me. Or I yeah. mean, they're at least shown to be truly decent guys through and through. Yeah. And real, real quick, he does sketch your, like their whole history. But basically, they're just really bitterly poor Italian people on a freighter who were running away from World War II, the events unfolding. So yeah. they jumped off at America because they heard the streets were paved with gold. And if you heard our Palm Sunday, or I'm sorry, our Jailbird episode, I do think there's a lot of Sacco and Vanzetti through lines. Yeah. They went door to door, realized the American dream is that. a lie, blah, blah, blah. But through their own ingenuity, are destined to become fabulously wealthy. Like the American dream for them was true. It actually works out for them. Yeah. Because um, they found a construction company. But anyway, because Rudy's dad, Otto, was nice to them when they first came to town and were poor immigrants with no food and no one and couldn't speak English, they love the family. So you'll hear them pop up because they often defend... Like, after Rudy is a notorious murderer, they're still nice to him. They're the only people. When he and his mom are completely poor, they let them live rent-free in a Mar Maritimo brother's house. Yeah. So those guys are there. But skipping back ahead, we just scared the shit out of Celia. What happens after that? <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, I think it's a year later, it's not much long later, Felix gets drafted for World War II. So he has to go. And to be a radio announcer, though, that's important. He will not face combat danger. <laughs> yeah, and also, and I think the family doesn't know that quite yet, so they're like, ah, they're they're making a, a thing of it as no, much as no. they do. No, no, he well, says his parents are very withdrawn, but uh, he says no one cried. And yeah. he contrasts that with the Maritimo family who came over to have brunch oh, or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were all loudly sobbing because they found out the same day in the same batch of drafts that their son was drafted. Yeah, and. His parents acted like it was unseemly that they were crying so much. And he's like, but I don't know why. They were right. Their son died in World War II. Yeah. Like, that was a funeral. <laughs> they knew that. <laughs> or, you know. They were right about it, yeah. Totally. It's, there's a Six Feet Under episode in season one where Nate is like, why do Americans do the sanitized version of, like, you're not supposed to cry, step out of the room? And, you know, he literally says, yeah, you know, I was in Greece once in Sicily and I saw this woman screaming and ripping her clothes and pounding on the coffin. And he's like, that seems more reasonable if someone <laughs> yeah. dies young, especially, and you really miss them or whatever. Or they die tragically. Yeah, you should be allowed. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of standard portraits of withdrawn, awkward white people who can't deal with anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the waltzes get a visit from Eleanor Roosevelt who mm -hmm. is going around the country just trying to be supportive of the war effort in various towns. And since they're the most famous family in the town, they get a visit from her. They have lunch with her. Dad has long ago vocally said, Hitler's wrong. I made a huge mistake. He's a dangerous. And he's like now says instead of being a good, simple man, he's like, he's a brilliant evil genius and he manipulated me into it. so yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're not Nazis <laughs> anymore somewhere in there August Gunther's head is blown off yeah so also <laughs> it kind of in the background August Gunther's head is blown off by a gun no one can figure out why and then a little bit later on Rudy will narrate that the police chief Francis Morrissey accidentally shot Gunther's head off and Otto and other people in the community kind of circled the wagons around him and said, yeah, that was an accident. You couldn't help it. Let's just dump Gunther's body in the river and forget about it because we shouldn't ruin your life over a gun just accidentally going off. A gun just goes off. It's not a big deal. Right. It's a total throwaway. Like you basically just said as many sentences as will be said about it in the book. It's yeah. a little vignette, but obvious contrast of like, well, this guy's the chief of police, and he accidentally murdered someone, and nothing bad happened to him. Life yeah. is nonsense. Because <laughs> yeah, this cause... guy's about to accidentally murder someone, and it 
is the only thing that defines the rest of his life, you know? Right, right. So because older son Felix is about to go to war and they do some last family time stuff if they go shooting together and they go driving together. And then Otto wants to be very dadly and says, hey, younger son Rudy, now you get the key to the gun cabinet. It was, or gun collection, I guess. It was previously for Felix because he was older and he was more mature. Now you are the man in the house other than me and you get the gun key and you can have it. And we find out later two really awful things which are... Are, he's 12 at this time, yeah. and he says, I, I know, very young to let a kid have solo access to the gun closet, right? Well, my dad thought I was 16. I would find out later in the police report that he thought I was 16. Yeah, just... Also, Felix would later point out something that I'm now like, yeah, that sounds true. Dad is so lazy. Felix was like, you know why he treated it like a great honor to have the key to the gun closet? Because whoever had the key had to oil and clean the guns once a month, and he just didn't want to do it. It was a trick. He's just tricking his dumb kids to clean the guns. (laughs) So all this shit is really Otto's fault. He's a no good guy. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And they they get back to the house. The house has like a a cupola on top of it. Cupola? Cupola. Uh, It's an actual word. I should know that. Francis Ford Cupola. The Rudy is feeling just very masculine even though he's 12 and he also described himself as very skinny uh, and just sort of a funky shaped person so he's not good at stabilizing himself but he gun. feels like being handed the key to the gun room is like his bar mitzvah he's yeah. like today I am a man because of this and so he's like <laughs> I'm gonna go sit in the cupola with a gun cause that's cool you know what I'm even gonna load it you know what I'm even gonna kinda aim it just at the sky why not you know what I'm gonna fire a bullet off cause I'm a man and just does it and we learn he shoots a pregnant lady in the head by accident Yep. And he says, uh, yeah, his defense is, of course, as a child, I just wasn't considering consequences. Yeah. And I was such a great marksman, I figured if I aimed at nothing, nothing is what I would hit. Yeah, yeah It yeah. didn't occur to him that bullets have to <laughs> end somewhere. So he shoots Eloise Metzger in the head. She's the wife of the guy named George Metzger, who's yeah. the city editor of the local paper. She's also pregnant. And she, she was just out vacuuming as a, in, in their house. I should well, I say like, out vacuuming. He says, the yard. it's funny, uh, he's like... She was upstairs in the second story alone, vacuuming the guest room while pregnant on Mother's Day. She deserved to get shot. (laughs) And he's like, obviously, I'm joking. (laughs) You can tell from context. (laughs) It's a bit. But he means like, what are the odds? Why was this pregnant mother vacuuming the room alone upstairs while her family ate breakfast? Why did this happen? Yeah. (laughs) How does that even happen? Right, exactly. And And so Chief Morrissey in the background finds her realizes from the bullet and also from just there was a gunshot over by the Waltz house that, oh, maybe it was over there. And it's like a unique casing from an antique gun, and he knows they have a vast antique gun collection, yeah. Yeah, and so he goes there and does the kind of thing that they had done for him when he blew off Gunther said He's just kind of little, he hints at, hey, maybe we can just let this go if it happened over here. He wants to give them a break, and Otto is an asshole. Otto decides to make a big dramatic show of we definitely, like, uh, my son definitely shot her. It's definitely my fault. I am a romantically committed to justice person, and I just want everyone to know that we shot this lady. And the chief is like, fucking fine. Okay, you're guilty. I wanted to just kind of make get this, brush this under the rug and everything would be fine. But okay, your son's guilty and you are too. Here we go. Yeah, and it's not even, even to the point where he didn't call backup, still he could have sobbed and shit and no one would have come. Yeah. But the dad is so, and of course a lot of the book is spent trying to figure out, why did my dad do that to me? And uh, there's great theories, including like, he was so bored with life, this was the first interesting thing he'd ever been offered to be a part of, like the (laughs) first play he could ever be in. Yeah. Or... He truly thought he was such a piece of shit that he just wanted to demonstrate for the community, I know how awful I am, I'm so, so sorry, for the Nazi shit, for being a shitty dad, for just, and like, because they'll say later, there's hints that he has very low self-esteem. He thinks of himself as a piece of garbage. So maybe he just wanted to demonstrate that he's a piece of garbage, but much like when he fired the gun, he didn't consider the consequences on his son (laughs) when he did it. (laughs) So he runs up and he literally like uses tools to rip all the guns apart and that's not enough. So he dismantles their attic and like breaks the support joist and kicks at it and screams and sobs until the roof of their house slides off and crushes the policeman's car. 
Right. So then just because he has no ride, two other cops come to pick him up, and they're like, I'm sorry, Chief, we can't but help but overhear this guy repeatedly screaming that he shot the lady that's in the morgue. <laughs> right. We're going to arrest him. And we then the police chief is like, all right, my hands are tied, dude. <laughs> you did it to yourself. I'm sorry. You're arrested. Yeah. Yeah. So they both get arrested, and Rudy is taken to just the basement of the courthouse because he's a minor. Yeah, he can't really be charged with anything because he's a minor, and Otto is right that Otto will be charged with the negligence and so on, but Rudy is now famously in town, the kid who shot a pregnant lady, and uh, will pick up the nickname Dead Eye Dick and the scorn of the community and also be mistreated by the cops. It's a small town. It's the most dramatic crime murder that's happened ever, of course, so everyone knows about it. The prosecutor, in the interest of putting Otto away for a long time, will say in the trial, like, vividly describe the beautiful little fetus in her tummy dying. So, like... His name is just mud in this town as much as it can be. And it's a small town, so it's that vibe, you know, like he's done in this town. Uh, And not only that, but the police straight up viciously abuse him. They're a little easier on him as a child than they are with the dad. They throw the dad down a flight of stairs and beat the shit out of him. But with Rudy... They say a bunch of racist shit, and they tell him someone's going to murder you. The relatives will murder you. I'd be scared if I were you, too. And it is a great scene for me, especially, I think, relevant in this time in America, where he is like, this was the time in my life where I had the shock as a white person of being like, oh, I thought all policemen were very upstanding citizens who were always your friend. (laughs) These guys are like turning off the security cameras so they can beat up a kid and call him the N-word. I didn't know police were like that. It turns out they are. (laughs) Because I I think they even even like paint his face with black tar or ink or something. Yeah. And so then they say, now that your face is black, we can treat you like we treat black people. And he's like, I didn't know they treat black people like that. You shouldn't treat the black people like this. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, he's 12, so that's his excuse, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But I love, and he's like, and rather confusingly, one of them yelled at my dad, how does it feel to be an N-word now, you Nazi? And he's like, that doesn't even match up. (laughs) Nazi starts with N. Uh, (laughs) No, but like, you know. Yeah, right. You couldn't join the Nazi party. You see where I'm going. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Um, So they they both have a horrible night. Yeah. And they also, the police parade everyone in town who wants to see Rudy past him. And then they are very excited for like the final person to parade is George Metzger, the husband of the killed woman. And they're like, oh. But right before that, the... Martimo brothers are the only two people who are like, this is disgusting. You should all be ashamed. Then they leave. Then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and then George comes by and the police are like, great. You know, we can let you yeah. beat the kid up and go this for it. Because like, whatever you want to do. The victim's husband. Yeah. And George is just sad and he doesn't want to do it. And also there's the first point of a few points in the book where Rudy, as the narrator, says that a thing he does mentally when something horrible happens is he turns it into a play in his head. He, tur- he just turns it into a script where characters are having this happen to them instead of actual real life. And so this becomes a short playlet where George gives a nice speech and uh, tries to be a kind person about the whole thing and says that, no, just life is cruel and this kid's just an idiot and, and he didn't intend to do it and, and let's not be mean to each other. Yeah, it's such a good blivet technique. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. the book is broken up not only by recipes, but there's three or four little one-act plays as well, and they're very good. So then what happens? Yeah, George basically shames the police into doing things by the book. Yeah. Because he's like, you know, he says, this is disgusting, this is not what I want, and the police are like, oh, sorry, okay, well, (laughs) take him upstairs. Nothing to see here, everyone move along. Right. The trial unfolds, Otto goes to jail for two years only because it was an accident, but the trial is so damaging that a civil suit follows. His family becomes destitute. All their money goes to the Metzgers, as well it should. And the pharmacy chain that used to support them slowly goes out of business because they invested too heavily in food and soda fountains. They should have stuck with, which will become a big theme, they should have stuck with selling meth because that's what everyone is on (laughs) these days in the 30s, 40s, 50s, is amphetamines, uh, legal amphetamines. (laughs) And he's like, yeah, so basically... My mom became a shell of herself and never came out of her room. I was the maid servant for both my mom and dad. We are completely destitute. The only thing we had is the house, and we just stayed there. And when Felix got home and was like, this sucks, he made a joke, I think. He's like, I wonder what the Metzgers are going to do with a million dollars. The parents, like, slapped him and were like, it's none of our fucking business what they do with their money. 
Yeah. You know, so like the family is determined to live under the shame of this event forever. That's it from now on. They're like all on board with like, let's just withdraw from the community and right. show everyone we know how we how bad we fucked up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, right, and the community nicknames Rudy Dead Eye Dick. Rudy and his mom, Emma, moved to what he calls a shitbox in a suburb called Avondale that the Maritimos built. It's, but it's not a, a nice suburb. It's just a, a place they can find a, a cheap place. But the Maritimos give it to them rent-free because they yeah. literally can't afford anything out of the kindness of their hearts. So it's not yeah. like the Maritimos are trying to stuff them in a shitbox. No, yeah, which it's just like, what they can get. Just yeah. the, when I first read the phrase, and then we ended up in a shitbox in Maritimo, like owned yeah. Avondale, I was yeah. like, oh, did they come to hate him? No. No. It's just they build tract housing, and they gave him a free one, which is actually quite kind. Yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And also, uh, Rudy becomes the, as we said before, he becomes the servant to his mom and then both his parents for the rest of their lives. He's just taking care of them and serving them and also working a night shift at, I think it's the Shram Drugstore. It's another drugstore. Damn, man. That's not I say Shram. Oh, <laughs> that's another one. See, I, I just don't know how to pronounce stuff, I think, honestly. Like, that's oh, that's neither, a name. Yeah. Like, that, there's definitely a way to do it. His name's uh, Rudai. <laughs> and also, uh, the Metzgers moved to Florida. They don't feel any better about the situation than anybody else. The dad becomes dedicated to gun control and disarmament. Yeah. Yeah. Where he basically uses the money he made to found a paper that very few people read, arguing that there should be stricter gun control. He gives the rest of his money to his kids, and his kids lead their own lives, and they're pretty disconnected from their dad. And that's like the whole story of the Metzgers. Yeah, yeah. And we're also, and we pretty much stay in Midland City for the rest of the book, except for Rudy is uh, finishing up school, and he's encouraged by a teacher to go and write a play. Rudy tries to write a play about. A man named John Fortune who went off to the Himalayas. A real guy from their town. Yeah. And, uh, a friend of his dad's who wisely, when he found out about the Nazi stuff, had the foresight to be like, don't ever talk to me again. Right. <laughs> he became his dad's enemy, but they were once friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he, uh, and he writes about Fortune going to Kathmandu, and the teacher, Miss Shoop, as Rudy's teacher says, you must find your own Kathmandu, which is writing a play. And so Rudy, as a third job, basically, between taking care of his parents and working at the drugstore, also writes up the play and submits it to a contest, and he wins. And the prize is putting it up for at least one night in New York City. So he briefly moves to New York City and finds that, oh, in New York, I'm not Dead-Eye Dick. I'm just a guy who wrote a play. And it's literally the first time he's left his hometown. And it's a beautiful sequence for many layered reasons. But one is uh, the local production that they work up before it wins and goes to New York. Celia plays Celia Hildreth soon to be Hoover, yeah. plays the female lead. And that was like a magical time for them. Otherwise, they're basically strangers, but they always have this shared like soft spot in their hearts because they did really get along when for three weeks they did this thing. Yeah. And she, who has always been called pretty but dumb, it meant a lot to her that she was saying lines that sounded smart to her. And so like later, it's the setup for a really bad emotional gut punch later in the book. And then... Also because, as you say, I, he describes it as like, in Midland City, uh, there was always a cloud of like flies around my head. Yeah. And then in New York, it was gone for the first time. And I didn't realize it could ever go away. And I realized what the buzzing cloud was, was little bits of information that I knew people knew about me. So like, he never realized he could go to a city that's so big that, frankly, no one knows if you murdered two people. <laughs> like, yeah, you may have. No one knows. They're all strangers. It's a clean yeah. slate in a way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's also, and it's not a particularly successful clean slate for him either. At least his play is, he says it's very bad and the actors are constantly asking him, what do I do? Why am I doing this? And he's like, I don't know, but let's figure, uh, do you have any ideas? And it's not yeah, a good way to write a play. He's so like affected by being in New York for the first time that his mind is somewhere else. And like a guy says like, what is the meaning of this line? Why do I say this? And he reads it and he's like, huh. I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote that. <laughs> like, <laughs> so it doesn't go well. And like in Midland City, it was the winner. But by New York standards, he's like, even objectively, I could see. It was a very mediocre, crappy play. Yeah, right. And they did it once to humor me because I won a contest and I went home. Yeah. And, uh, and before he goes home, uh, his brother Felix is there and he, Felix and his wife split up and Rudy is just in the building, I think on the balcony. Felix will end up having five wives and we don't find yeah. out how they all get together and break up, but that's just, <laughs> he's that guy. 
yeah. when they're kids, he says, you know what I don't want to be? The kind of bum who gets married and divorced over and over. There's something wrong with a guy like that. And then he's that guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so since they split up, Felix and Rudy both head back to Midland City. They're getting a flight from Fred Barry, who has a company, Barrytron, and a plane to get them there. That's all characters and places and companies from Breakfast of Champions. And there's also a blizzard going on in Midland City, so it's very hard to find a place to land. Stuff starts unfolding quickly here. <laughs> yeah, and also, yeah, I think we could probably blitz through a lot of the rest of it. Well, there. it is reaching the end, but I mean, just at the end, it's end weighted. Like, yeah, a lot yes. of stuff. So in this one day, his play wraps up. The richest people in Midland City, who are Fred Barry and his mom, who are like weapons contractors, fly them home in a private jet. And yeah. he looks down and realizes that there's an earth shattering blizzard that's killing tens of thousands of people. Yeah, these yeah. all happen in roughly like a twelve hour period. <laughs> <laughs> and the, we find out the blizzard also gave his dad Otto double pneumonia, which will be fatal, and gave their mom Emma some frostbite. And so they catch up with them in the hospital and, and try to help them out. But, you know, they can only do so much. Right, because the door of their house blew down and filled with snow, and his parents are so helpless, they just sat in the snow till someone came to help them. So they are fucked. Right. And, and they also... What's and next? I forget. I think I, think I might have front-loaded them going to Avondale. That happens after the house has its doors blown off, I guess. Yeah, it's um, tough with Kurt because he's always predicting. Somewhere yeah. in there, he will tell you that their ultimate end is... He ends up living alone with his mom after dad dies in Avondale. It turns out that the mantelpiece in their living room above the fireplace yeah. was made of cement that was mistakenly, like, gathered or mixed near where the government was secretly testing nuclear devices before the war broke out or, like, while yeah, Manhattan like Project Oak was Ridge, happening. Yeah, like Oak Ridge, Tennessee, I think. Oak Ridge, yeah. So... Uh, his mother dies of brain tumors that she gets from sitting in front of the mantelpiece, which he doesn't like to do as much, so he doesn't. Yeah. Um, and they will then become wealthy again by suing the Maritimo brothers. Right. Once his mom dies, he'll hook up with Felix and Bernard Ketchum, ironically, the lawyer who once sued him on yeah. behalf of the victims, to it's found their hotel in Haiti, the Hotel Olufsen, and then they live in Haiti. And then he writes this book. Yeah, um, and there's some details in there I'm skipping. So what are they? No, okay. <laughs> well, one because uh, we you just mentioned Bernard Ketchum as a lawyer in the book, mm -hmm. and this is one of a couple books where Vonnegut has a very briefly, very not really sketched out at all, but just a character who's like an invincible lawyer. You know, who's just yeah, a lawyer who will stopped. win every case. I think that's just Vonnegut's device for whenever I need legal proceedings, I'll just have a lawyer who you know will win. So I just put him on the side that wins, and then that's yeah. all I have to describe it. Like, what was the name of... Well, it was uh, Roy Cohn was in... Uh, no, but I'm thinking all the way back to Rosewater. And then Norman Mushari. Mushari, I They love sketch that him out a lot yeah. more. But yeah, it's just Vonnegut's thing of... I, I just deal with legal proceedings in my books. They just happen, and the good lawyer wins. And right. Go, that's it. Oh, yeah. But the thing that I do think is crucial to the plot that we sort of overlooked is the brain tumors make his mom a crotchety old lady and she gets in a feud with Fred T. Berry. Yeah. And Fred T. Berry then sells Barrytron, the weapons company, and moves all his wealth out of the town. Shortly after that, a neutron bomb explodes in the town, <laughs> killing everyone in the town. Right. And it's heavily implied that Fred T. Berry made of, may have made a secret deal with the government to allow the testing of a neutron bomb in the town because they can't test it anywhere else in the world without triggering World War III. Right. But they want to see what it does to people. Yeah, because also <laughs> the, the story the public is given is that a truck fell over or something. Yeah. But based on the evidence, it blew up, I think, what, like 60 feet above ground Testing or something? Testing shows that the detonation so, happened in the air. Yeah. So it must have been dropped. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or and he's it, like, unless the truck was a pop-up toaster for nukes. <laughs> <laughs> But, of course, and, they've already moved to Haiti by then, so they're spared miraculously. Rudy and Felix, I mean. Yeah. And Bernard yeah. Ketchum. But basically all the other characters we know die. Celia's already dead from drinking Drano. Yeah. There were, uh, what happened to her real quick in a nutshell is she got addicted to legal over-the-counter prescription amphetamines. And this is true in Breakfast of Champions as well. Yeah. Everything that happened in Breakfast of Champions happened, and she drank Drano. And you can assume... Her husband went nuts, beat up Francine Pefko. And then I guess you can now assume a few months later, Dwayne Hoover also is killed in a neutron bomb explosion. <laughs> right? Like that really so, puts an yeah. end cap on Breakfast of Champions. Yeah. I don't know if, if every detail 100% lines up uh, as far as the chron chronology of what happens in the books, but it pretty much does. And yeah, it sort of wraps around the breakfast story where everyone will be vaporized yeah. <laughs> in, the, in breakfast. In the end. You so just who know even that cares? Yeah. yeah. So our final epilogue chapter, 
is uh, the trip back to Midland City, right? They take a trip home. Yeah, and so the military has zoned off Midland City to, they say, to prevent looters. I feel like there's an implication that they need to study it to see what the bomb did, but they have it completely roped off and protected by the government, and no one can go yeah. into the empty buildings. It's also implied guard. they want to keep it looking nice because they have film crews making documentaries showing how neutron bombs are really safe. <laughs> yeah. Quote unquote, right. Right. Meaning they don't damage buildings, like things that cost money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so this is a trip by Rudy and Felix and also Hippolyte, their Haitian Creole uh, uh, head waiter at the hotel, who really runs the hotel and actually knows what he's doing. They just kind of hang out. Yeah. Again, um, two white dudes in a black country making money off of black bodies. But that's yeah, <laughs> whatever, I guess. <laughs> and not the first Vatican book. Kind no, of no, no. Where he's like. It's often a thing. He's like, then I got sad about life so i let a black guy do a job and took half the money i just sit around thinking about how i'm sad <laughs> yeah, yeah it's like all right felix by this point has decided for some reason maybe sadness maybe chemicals that he loved celia all along even though he probably did just because she died yeah I, is it like he hears she died and then he is immediately like she was the only woman I ever loved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and before that and before the bomb blew everything up, they had gone to her funeral after she drank Drano. And Dwayne and Felix kind of have a moment, which is a playlet, where they sort of agree that they're both fine. And you think maybe there's going to be some violence, but Dwayne is like, no, if you loved her, that's great. Like, I don't think she loved me. I, I think we were kind of distant, and I'm glad there was something in her life like that, if there was. And Felix is like, oh, thanks for not punching me. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, go our separate ways. Yeah. <laughs> but they And they go to the grave and uh hippolyte says hey i can raise celia from the dead as a ghost if you want like you know if you want it'll be sort of a spectral version of her and you can just right. talk to her and, and feel get closure so it's like start sobbing yeah and uh rudy is not offended but explains like this is this is cool this is just a cultural difference right <laughs> you have to understand like a white midwestern guy thinks it's offensive that you would suggest i'll bring your dead girlfriend back as a ghost right now yeah and he's like why if he wants to see her, why would it be offensive if I made that happen? I don't understand white people, which is yeah. good. I love the perspectives clashing. <laughs> <laughs> and then Felix turns down that offer. And so instead, Hippolyte raises, I think it was John Fortune? He raises somebody else. No, Will Fairchild. That's right, Will Fairchild. Uh, who yeah. is a famous uh, barnstormer pilot war hero from the town who died because he got shot out of his plane and he didn't have his parachute on. That's right, yeah. And Hippolyta, as we said, his magic powers are real. And in the beginning of the book, we see a ghost who haunts the town who is supposedly a medical student who saw something unsavory and is haunted by it. And that ghost is gone now because of the neutron bomb, but Hippolyta says, someone who is ancestrally from this place needs to haunt it. It's like a sign of, I guess it's something they do in Haiti. I don't know if he's making that up, if that's true of Haitian culture, yeah. but like in the voodoo <coughs> teaching, someone with roots here, it shouldn't just be government people and scientists here. I should raise a ghost who's going to haunt it, who's like a Midland person through and through. Yeah, and he's like, then raise Will Chip Fairchild. Everyone loved that guy. He was a like a war hero, good old boy from the town. Yeah. And he's like, okay. So then the last <laughs> image is, and from then on, Will Fairchild wandered, wandered around the town. I'm stealing this from Simpsons, but like from the tire fire to the nuclear plant. But then it ends with, to where there used to be a library, but now it's paved. And you know yeah. from earlier that that's where they buried all the bodies of the people killed in the neutron bomb. So Will Fairchild haunts this mass grave on behalf of all the people murdered in Midland City. And I'm sure the punchline that we're supposed to take away is no one in the government will be punished for any of these mur vicious murders. Right. And yet Rudy had to be punished for accidentally shooting this pregnant lady. That's life. That's peepholes for you, right? Like, I think that's why the book ends that way. Yeah, he's kind of the person held accountable for a death in, in oh, the book. And there's so <laughs> many unaccounted for deaths. And I think that's his big point is like, yeah. it's weird how we think it's so important to administer justice to a murderer, even if it was accident or negligence, or they like have mental problems because they have drug problems. But like, we kill each other left and right, willy nilly, constantly in ways that are approved. Yeah. We sell each other meth. Like, even gets to the point where the doctor who prescribed Celia increasing doses of meth her li whole life knew it was bad and just right. wanted a bigger house and shit. Like, he explicitly says that guy just thought it was worth it. He did, you know? Yeah. And Dwayne her... knows it. Dwayne right. is like, it's... Dwayne beats the shit out of the doctor after fault. she kills herself. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just like, yeah. <laughs> I really think of this as Vonnegut's crime and punishment. And cool. it has much the same message, which is crime and punishment is arbitrary. <laughs> I've, I've never read Crime and Punishment. 
Well, it's, it's supposed it, to be fantastic. It's good. It's been so long that I don't want to like. I can't recap the plot off the top of my head. No, you don't. But the you takeaway don't. theme was very much like, "Why me for this crime? Getting punished this much? That guy did this crime and nothing happened. It like, why is it this way? Yeah. It's like his. You know, Mr. Rosewater was money. This is justice. Why do we think justice is real? Yeah. How we move justice around? How people hoard justice? And like perverse ways to use justice. Otto uses it to like. Sh- is this meat? Did I like shove no, some meat I, in here? I, I feel we, like we might be ready to move I on. I think we can move into another segment yeah, called I think so. The Meat. Oh. Choppy chop. Oh, choppy yeah. chop. Choppy chop. Not a chopper! <laughs> Gets with a chopper. Yeah. This is, if you've never heard the show, this is where we get into any other huge themes we want to hit that we haven't hit. And we can just do it right now because, yeah, we're way into it. Yeah, that justice in reading it. makes me like the book a little more than I did. That's a really cool insight that I hadn't reached. Well... My the biggest thing that's gonna kill the most time, so I'm gonna like rapid fire get it out of the way is this is the first time I ever like scrupulously gathered evidence as if this were an essay, like that was due. <laughs> so I just wanna say, like, yeah, it blew my mind all the little times that the duality of crime and punishment and justice either being served overly or not being served is there. And yeah. I'm gonna like rattle off examples. His family made their money selling drugs that are now illegal, but it doesn't matter. Otto was lazy, a guy who hated the family business. He gets all the money anyway for no reason. Police Chief Morrissey committed an identical crime and never gets punished. The Marie Taimo, those nice brothers, <laughs> um, <laughs> the Mario brothers, get wealthy through hard work, which seems like there's justice there. But they also murder someone they were trying to help by accident, just yeah. like Dead Eye Dick. They murder their dear friend Emma with a radioactive mantelpiece, and they don't get punished because they happen to have died by old of old age before anyone found out. But yeah. also, should they be punished like they didn't mean to? The neutron bomb kills, obviously, thousands of people, but he makes a point of saying it also killed the six people at Shepherdstown Correctional Facility who were on, sitting on death row. Yeah. So I guess they deserved it? to get killed by a neutron bomb. <laughs> so, like, that's obviously calling it out. Oh, I, I just love this whole, like, run. They end up living in a slum owned by immigrants who came with nothing, who their rich father helped. Then they get their money back by suing the descendants of those immigrants for the death of their mother, which was <laughs> unintentional anyway. Right? <laughs> Bernard Ketchum is blind in one eye and wears an eye patch. Because as a child, a friend accidentally shot him in the eye with a BB gun. Yeah. If it was a real gun, it would be the same crime, but it just wasn't. Oh, right. It would blow his um, head off. It was right. More, yeah. The doctor, uh, who's a piece of shit who deals meth, they talk about how everyone knew as a kid he tortured dogs and cats and that he knowingly has ruined people's lives. He's basically just a glorified meth dealer. He also, when his mom had frostbite, just put a bunch of lotion on her hands and put her hands in bags. And they found out later that no one's ever treated frostbite that way. Like, he was just winging it. And he says, <laughs> no, about that. Yeah. And he says no harm done, luckily, which I think is kind of the moral of the book. No harm done, but it's just through sheer luck that no harm was done. Like, it's just sheer luck that you got shot with a BB and I shot this lady with a real bullet, you know? The guns. Otto's so upset by the shooting that he has all their guns melted down and destroyed. Rudy, later in his life, calculates those guns were almost certainly, because it was World War II, melted and turned into grenades and bullets and killed probably dozens <laughs> and dozens of people. Like, how is it different? Yeah, the same metal. Because there were scrap drives and everything <laughs> exactly. in real life. So. And he feels so guilty about these two deaths, but he never has given a thought to the fact that, like, he doesn't oppose the war. Felix thinks Midland City is real and Hollywood is fake. Bunny thinks Midland City is fake and Hollywood is real. Oh yeah, we should because Dwayne so and Celia Hoover are miserable no matter what. Because <laughs> Dwayne and Celia Hoover are both in the book from Breakfast Champions, and also their son Bunny, they're who ostracized, is gay, ostracized son, and yeah. gay, and plays piano at the hotel. Uh, he's also in the book, and yeah, that that's a great back and forth where they yeah. both jointly agree that the other place is fake. Yeah. Oh, and then last but not least, at the near the very end of the book, possibly in that blog, he says, uh, and then this happened and this happened. We bought the hotel. Boom, 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 wrapping up. Oh, weirdly, at one point in there, through a misunderstanding, I was suspected of abducting and murdering a little girl. Yeah. But it didn't go bad. I like <laughs> People found out it wasn't me, and it worked out. It's like he just throws in like, it could happen to you twice. You could be dead eye dick twice. Like this, <laughs> j- this system of justice could fuck you for no reason twice. Like you think lightning only strikes you once, but no. Yeah. Any shit can happen. The system's broken, so randomness is in the system. <laughs> That's also what he 
he's accused of abducting that little girl. Way worse than what he did. <laughs> right. He did. He really didn't do it. And also the investigation turns into a, probably the funniest chunk of the book to me because the <laughs> cops, there's one part where Rudy has bought a really nice car for himself because he's just been excellent at saving money and also they're not being charged rent. And the cops, in order to investigate the crime, thoroughly look over every inch of his car and they come back and say... We didn't find the girl's prints. We also didn't find any prints, hair, any even micro sign of anyone besides you in the car. Yeah. Or, do you have no friends? Are you really lonely? <laughs> yeah. Are you like a big loser? And he's like, yes. I am. Which he is. because, And that's the other <laughs> portrait of justice in here, right? It's a portrait of someone punishing themselves for the crime. Like he's not oh, yeah. letting the system take care of it. He never has love in his life. He says at one point, I feel homosexual, but I actually think of myself as asexual because I've never had sex with anyone and I can't know. Yeah. Like, I think I might be gay, but I've never even gone down a road with anyone like towards sex. I am a pharmacist and I'm often depressed and there's lots of things pills help with. I never allow myself pills. He's like living a life of self-punishment, I think, basically, right? Like yeah, he's totally. decided he's a loser. Yeah. And he's going to make it true. So you didn't like it as much, but did you unearth any big, like, bowel-shaking uh, consequences here? The very last line of the whole book hadn't made as much sense to me until we got into the justice stuff. Because mm -hmm. the very last line is Rudy saying, you want to know something? We are still in the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages, they haven't ended yet. And now n feeling that justice through line through it, it makes a lot more sense because the dark ages are defined by just violence is happening and there's no <laughs> order. Ignorance, and yeah. he's saying that life is still that despite our systems or because of our systems. And, and that's the way it goes. Could also be hopeful, though, in the sense that I don't know, it implies that things will get much, much, much better at some like don't settle for this. This is yeah. still pretty bad. Like, we can be better to our fellow human beings than this. Like, much better. <laughs> right, we can. We can do yeah. a lot better than this. We're going to do I... so much better that this will look like the Dark Ages, you know? Hopefully. Oh, yeah, it's very hopeful. Well, yeah. I'm trying to spin it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's there. Well, because without tracking justice being such a theme in it, I had tracked it much more as a book about randomness, which is there, I think. It's not... It's Definitely also there, yeah. Really part of it. And also, it some of the plotting felt a little random to me or a little loose, and mm -hmm. I, I was trying to figure out if that was almost a thing he was trying to directly put into the structure of the book itself. Like his book about randomness is oh, yeah. also bouncing around from this city and suddenly it's nuked and also we're in New York and also Hitler shows right. up. And it's sort of it's it's sort of a, a weird, what is it, Bildungsroman? Like following a kid yeah. growing up and becoming someone, but all this just crazy shit happens. Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. I'll buy it. But also... He can do that sometimes. Like slapstick yeah. was pretty random, and I don't think it was a, a, a commentary on chaos. But right. this time it might be legitimately intentional. Like it, it could be. Yeah. Those are the themes, and the other theme he always includes. I mean, there's like there's several, there's many themes because it's layered. But uh, I love how he never doesn't include things are what you make them, and meaning is in the eye of the beholder. Like symbols yes. have meaning once you invest them with meaning. The same thing can mean different things to different people, and meaning can change over time. So like the very first thing he opens with is the name Dead Eye Dick comes originally from, a, it's a sailing term. That metal thing with a hole in it yeah. that you would tie boats up to at a dock was called a dead eye. And a guy who does the tying is the dead eye dick. Like as your boat approaches, he runs out and grabs the rope. and But it serviced a bunch of boats. So a dead eye dick is a thing that receives a multiplicity of lines. Yeah. And to me, that reminded me of Serious Man when he's on the roof shaking the antenna. It's like he's being pulled in many different directions by these vast forces. Yeah. He's the dead eye dick, right? That's like the duality of meaning. It's a, basically the dead eye dick is a Kronos and classic infundibulum. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's all... a place where all meaning is up for grabs and anything can mean anything. Is he good? Is he bad? Was it an accident? Was it murder? It's everything. And, the, and that literal nautical dead eye dick, it's like how one symbol can be tied onto by a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. Yes, and, and used for different everything. purposes. Yeah. And then he immediately says, and then, of course, as you know, it's now come to mean someone who's a good shot. So it evolved. It's like a lungfish. It was an ocean term, and then <laughs> it walked onto the land. So meaning evolves, meaning changes. Yeah. The, and the, I'm sure that that appearance of a guy offering an apple is not a coincidence. Because Breakfast of Champions, the apple was the ultimate symbol of symbols. Yeah. So that's, uh, it's my favorite <laughs> trick he does is I love symbolism. And Kurt Vonnegut repeatedly 
uses symbolism to discuss the nature of symbolism. And that, I know that it's just like a meta trick, but it tickles me every time. I love it. <laughs> yeah, and it's visible too. It's, yeah. It's a weird... It's, it's weird. like clearly intentional, yeah. Because so much of symbolism can be vague or something that you're supposed to suss out. Like, I think it's Breakfast where he talks about how all art, like all fine art on some level, especially visual art, seems like a prank or an insult to poor people. It's like, oh, this is good because you don't understand it and rich people do. Yeah. Like, this is this is an, is an important thing and its importance is an indication that you suck because you're not educated and you're not, you haven't been wealthy enough to sit around and know what this picture means. You Which know? is amazing because at the same time, at the end of Breakfast and in this book, they mention Rabo Karabikian. Yeah, he comes The Temptation out. of St. Anthony, as you know from reading Breakfast, Vonnegut can also describe why an acrylic orange thing with a green stripe is the most beautiful yes. thing in life and can have every all the meaning of life packed into it. And then in this book, he shows you how also it does, and it's just bullshit for rich people. Yeah. Both are true. <laughs> and, he, and he's out to, Kurt is out to like democratize that symbolism. He's out to make yes. it, no, here's exactly what it is. You don't need to be magical or smart or have read the right other thing to get what I'm saying. This is it. And everyone yeah. should get to experience that and see that. I did also with the, when I was reading it as randomness mainly, the recipes jumped out to me. For one thing, he does repetition with so many different things. And I'll just put like repetitions, the strategy, I think, for him as yeah. a writer. And I felt like the recipes repeatedly coming up in the book, that was the least random thing. And that was a thing where... Unlike a lot of symbols and unlike a lot of just things you experience with your people, every recipe was a case of, no, you as a human can control this. This is a thing that you saw yourself put oh. the ingredients in, you saw yourself make it and do it, and this is something you can count on in life. This is a, st a standard thing you can hold on to. It's super funny you should mention that. Did you want to segment off our little recipe section? <laughs> <laughs> I thought we could. This is a book that allows for it. And we're well, the, even only, in a... the only other thing I was going to ask Meatwise is if you liked Rudy, and then oh. as a follow up, if you thought we were supposed to like him or dislike him, or he was not, or he was neutral, like a cipher. I think because I, I I I have yeah. confusion about it. <laughs> I would I would lean toward liking him. Yeah. Okay. I think I, and I think we're supposed to see him as someone who maybe was not going to be an amazing person or a great human, right. like great figure in history, but was someone who. Could have been a, a fine right. person, but I mean, was he broken. He believes in justice and fairness for the right humanitarian reasons. We see yeah. that because, like, Celia wants meth, and she tries to hit on him solely for the purpose of getting more meth, yeah. and he won't budge, even though she offers him literally gold pieces. <laughs> like, Dwayne is rich, and they have gold in their house, and she brings yeah, him, like, little ridiculous. bars of gold. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, just give me some meth. I will give you gold. And he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so I think he's a good guy, but I guess it's hard for me to get around and I've never murdered two people by accident, so maybe you just can't get over it. But I'm like, you really gonna let your whole life go by? Like that trip to New York didn't teach you that there could be another life than this? Or it doesn't yeah. help anyone for you to just be miserable for the rest of your life? It doesn't help George Metzger, you know, I don't know. Does well, it bring her back? No, that, yeah, that's a good argument against him as someone who's like- He's nice, but gets he's pathetic. An, <laughs> yeah, well, and he gets an opportunity to learn that he can have a full life and he doesn't take it anyway. Yeah. He yeah. kind of lets it go. It seems like he chooses to be unhappy after a certain point. Yeah. Well, and that was one, because I felt like the relationship between Rudy and Otto, it's playing out some dissatisfaction that Kurt had with his father, especially where you see in their lives that his father was an architect, like Kurt's grandfather had been an architect. And then in previous books, Kurt writes about how the depression cleaned out his father. He didn't have any architect work because no one was building. Everyone was broke. And his father also became upset about that, became a more withdrawn person, became more unhappy. And specifically influenced, he was like, never be an architect, Kurt Jr., never do that. You see that. how sad I am? You'll be sad like that, too. And this book, I think, directly plays out a lot of, my that dad was sad, and it made me sad. No, Otto literally says, art is a crock, son. 
you need to when he yeah. finds out he's written a play he goes oh you blasted fool yeah because he's fucking talks like an <laughs> asshole he says my son ye must do what i should have done these eons ago like make like odysseus and the siren do you remember what he did and he's like tied himself to the mast he's like that's right tie yourself to the mast and shove wax in your ears yeah never be an artist all it will do is ruin your life and then the narrator says something along the lines of like so my father had essentially ordered me to be a pharmacist instead so i did yeah <laughs> i gave up on that dream, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And he and so Kurt's kind of writing how that could have gone for him because his didn't father make the connection. Yeah. It's his father was scene. in the pretty creative profession of being an architect. Said never be an architect and sent Kurt to Cornell for chemistry, which is mm-hmm. you know basically pharmacy work if, right, if you're yeah. looking for like if a thin mask on your own life. Yeah. You know? And Kurt Vonnegut later goes on to be a writer, but Rudy just doesn't. And Kurt's I think exploring the the weight of that by not letting Rudy. Do the thing that would probably make sense plot wise totally. to, if not become a playwright, at least be in New York and be like, oh, right, I can just be Rudy Waltz here. I'll just do that some way. Like, I'll wait tables or something. I don't know. New life. Yeah. And he is Kurt Vonnegut. So maybe this is an imaginary life where Kurt Vonnegut didn't get to be a writer, right? Like, yeah. Uh, how much more empty would his life be? And there's that hint with the addition of like the through line, the guy who wrote the play about, John Fortune, yeah. going to Kathmandu and like, is there enlightenment there? Is enlightenment something you can find by going to a physical place that's holy and that whole thing's in there? But so now I feel yeah. like I don't know which way to go, either talk about food or talk about all the connections to Kurt's life because we've like thrown out either. A uh, couple more and then we'll eat. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there right, is Because cool. also I think Felix, the brother of Rudy, is a pretty clear Bernard cipher. Uh, uh, right, let's at least call match. it, man. I think we're into we're into Kurt Cameos, right, basically? Yeah, yeah let's, let's do a do segment it. called Kurt Cameo. Cameo. Red, gold, and green. Cameo. Red, gold, and curd. Cameo. <laughs> great. It's one of our longest ones, but it felt yep, great. It'll work. If you haven't heard the show, this is uh, where we pull out the ways that Kurt either literally or very symbolically wrote himself into his own book, as he does almost all the time. And uh, yeah, this one actually, the family connections are very interesting. And then also I think there's a literal Kurt Vonnegut from Breakfast of Champions cameos in this as well i think like in breakfast where he literally writes himself into the book i think there's like a very brief literal so uh, i didn't notice it this is like a where's waldo thing happening yeah let's do that one it's on in mine it's page 198 but it's at the funeral for Celia, Celia, and Rudy is looking around the crowd, and he, Rudy realizes he's been smiling because he's having just a thought to himself. <gasps> and you he feels, just blew my goddamn mind. Yeah. Sorry, finish your thought. It's great. Uh, Rudy feels very self-conscious. He's like, oh, I've been smiling. Why don't I look around and see if anybody noticed? And he, I'll just read it. I stopped smiling. I glanced around to see if anyone had noticed. One person had. He was at the other end of our pew, and he did not look away when I caught him gazing at me. He went right on gazing, and it was I who faced forward again. I had not recognized him. He was wearing large sunglasses with mirrored lenses. He could have been anyone. And in Breakfast of Champions, <sighs> Kurt Vonnegut, the author, is a, writing himself into the book as a character who has big mirrored sunglasses on. And to is, protect his identity from his yeah. characters. That's so genius! He, and it's cameo size, too, like an actual movie That's cameo. That's like a Stanley cameo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he's just at this funeral gazing at all his Breakfast Verse characters in his new Breakfast Verse book, which he is a character in, so he needs to recur in it right. like all the other characters do. Yeah, it's almost just a nod to, yes, this is a sequel to Breakfast, because yeah. here's me, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Kilgore Trout, I guess. No, that was the movie version. I'm like, is in that mirror world with that little cherub that held his hand? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> God, what a bad movie Breakfast of Champions was. Oh, it's so uh, awful. But that's amazing, man. That's I think that's the best find of our, the whole podcast so far. Oh, hey. That's great. I reread that page a lot because I was like, no way he really pulled this off. But he did. <laughs> he did. It's the man. I wondered who was that guy, and I chalked it up as random nonsense that doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I, re- I read a lot of the book as randomness, and there I was like, ah. I have it. to figure it out. Yeah. I um, also think uh, the bit where he watches how bad the play is going and he can't seem to wrap his head around the play and how to make the play good that has some connection to the Wanda June experience I feel like yeah super directly yeah because the preface of Wanda June yeah, in the preface of, if you don't know, Happy Birthday, Wanda June was a play that Kurt Vonnegut wrote in life and uh, premiered in New York. The play also was performed at a theater called the Theater de Lis, 
And that's where Kathmandu happens in this book. He even, oh, it's the actual theater. He pulls it in. Geez, you're, and in the you preface, the left, right knowledge jazz. This is amazing. <laughs> I didn't notice that. And in the preface of Wanda June, Kurt talks about how the play gradually got better as they rehearsed it because the uh, the actors had better ideas than he did and would just like fix it for him. Yeah. And so he's just writing that as Ruby's experience. That, yeah. 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 Because absolutely, Kurt felt like he was a bad playwright who did a bad job right. of a bad play. And a play about an adventuring kind of hero who goes around the world. Yeah. And so then that's that's pretty directly in the book. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say Felix is his brother. The parents match up with Kurt's parents. Uh, yes. And I think he's also translating his Although mother's I, suicide in a lot of ways into the into mother. Celia. that Right. Oh, uh, no. Into uh, the lady, into Emma? Eloise Metzger, who Rudy shoots. There's some aspects of the death being huh. on Mother's Day and Kurt's oh. mother committed suicide on Mother's Day. I felt um, like... But she's kind of spread out through it. Yeah, I felt like Emma sort of depicted what his mother's depression felt like. Yes. And then Celia remained like just the avatar of suicidality. Yeah, certainly, I think all, all three of them are Kurt's mom. Yeah. yeah. Which is kind of freaky. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of freaky <laughs> when you think about it that he didn't make his mom his mom. Yeah. But in Breakfast, he does explicitly say Celia's drank, killed herself and my mom killed herself, like in quick succession. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so he's blowing that out in this, which is tied to that book. Because Breakfast also, like you said, it's about Kurt's mom's suicide in many ways. And so he's drawing out it as he does a sequel. Any others? Those are the cameos for Those me. are the cameos. Yeah. But there are a ton of recurrings. Oh, yeah. Should we, we, we're, while we're in characters, let's do it. Let's yeah. go to a segment called Recurring Characters Update. Shred Carriage near Ricker. You... <laughs> trying to say it backwards. Rewinding it? Yeah. yeah that's re- that was <laughs> that's the rewind. Great. Rewind. Man. Doing it on the fly, that was amazing. Uh, <laughs> Let's get to huh. these characters. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed they end up running a hotel on, an, on a, a third world island. nation, like, like tropical kind of nation. Yeah, all yeah. the cat's cradle. That was there. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of direct people from the breakfast verse, as mm-hmm. we've been calling it. Dwayne Hoover, Celia Hoover, Bunny Hoover, Rabble Karabikian, who yeah, will the also nerd, be... The jock, the whole <laughs> breakfast verse. <laughs> they all get detention. They jump at the end. And they yeah. drink Drano. <laughs> John Hughes had a dark phase. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Robo Karabikian was in Breakfast Champions. Yep. He'll also be the main character in Bluebeard. Fred T. Berry and the company Berry Tron are in Breakfast. Uh, the Maritima family's in, in Breakfast. Midland City itself is kind of an Indian- mm-hmm. Ap- Indianapolis stand-in. It's in Indiana in Breakfast, but it's in Ohio in Dead Eye Dick. And it's the Ohio hometown of a, a character in Galapagos and also a place people visit in Hocus Jesus. Pocus. So it's all over. We need photos and string, red strings and tacks and stuff and a giant web, <laughs> like an insane yeah. person. I am, I'm heavily drawing on the Vonnegut yeah. Encyclopedia. Totally. Mark Leeds, Mark Leeds. Which is great. You got friend of the friend of the show. cast. Yeah. You got Pefko's in here. You got yeah. George Hickman Bannister, the dead football kids monument. Oh, I missed that. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> you got like just literally every last name he's ever used is used again. Yeah. There's, I think Henry Close is mentioned in passing. No, he's ma- oh. he's the made up ambassador that tells the oh. guy to go home. Oh, 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 yeah. He's mentioned the- so I guess it doesn't count, but I was like, Leland Clues, Henry Clothes, something there. Yeah, <laughs> that kind of is. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, there's a car that's Keedsler brand touring car, and Keedsler yes. was a last name from breakfast. You got Hoovers and Hooblers. You have a mention of the woman who spread among the black populace of the town the habit of doing bird calls. Yeah, yeah. You got yeah. everything. All the stuff. <laughs> if you made a movie, you could imagine any character that's not directly mentioned from Breakfast of Champions would be walking by in a crowd scene at some point. Oh, big time. Yeah, yeah. everybody we cast for that will just be in the BMS. background. We, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No movie time this time. Just see yeah. the previous. You get it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can't do better than Bruce Willis. Oh, yeah. He's uh, very <laughs> strapping. Uh, He's very vonnegut Yeah, he really, yeah, it's not his fault. I would it's say. not his fault. He's <laughs> just a bad fit for that universe. Yeah. And yeah, and I think those are all the... Oh, and also, uh, one of the Metzger kids is named Eugene Debs Metzger after the famous real-life socialist from Indiana, Eugene V. Debs, and Vonnegut uses him in a lot of works. Uh, the main character in Hocus Pocus is named after Eugene Debs. So that's one more pull. Ooh, haven't read that one. I Focus did a long focus. time ago. Cool. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think those are the recurring characters. And we might as well stop for a little bit of celebrating the recipes in this book. A little nosh. A segment called Kurt Vana Foods. You got your skin and bones. Have a little Vana food. Put some <laughs> meat on you. Yeah. 
This is a, a new segment because this is the first book of his we've read, and I think the last one. I think it's the only one he does it in, where there are actual recipes for food in the book. And I got very, very ambitious. I shouldn't say very ambitious. It takes like 15 minutes to make. Uh, but I made cornbread. In yeah. um, page 29 of mine, Ooh. there's a recipe for Mary Hubler's cornbread. I attempted to make it. I have not eaten it yet, and it's sitting here in the studio. I'm very excited. Why don't you cut us some pieces while I tell you the horrible tale of why my food is not here? <laughs> I was going to make the Linzer tort, which is like a raspberry jam oh, pie. That's a hardcore dessert. It's pretty hard. It was hardcore, but I had all the ingredients. Yeah, that's foil. Deal with it. It's a podcast. There's foil. Uh, what did you want him to do? Just have hair and dust dropping on the cornbread as he brought it to work? <laughs> so, I tried to make the Linzer tort. You can find the recipe in there. It sounds delicious and easy to make. But after uh, an hour of screwing with that, <laughs> I gave up because the dough was not congealing. Like, I don't know. I sifted the flour wrong or something. And this is just so funny to me because you were just saying how you think you included recipes because they're one thing you can count on. <laughs> like, if you follow <laughs> oh, the directions, sorry. it'll work I out. Really set that up. Sorry. <laughs> so then I switched to the easiest possible thing because it was 1 a.m. and we had to do this in the morning. And you already were like, I'm a pimp. I made cornbread. And I was like, fine. I'll make the easiest, stupidest thing in the book, the barbecue sauce. Mary Hubler's barbecue sauce, which is basically you just heat some ketchup and brown sugar for five minutes. <laughs> and I was like, at least I made something. I'm a team player. We can dip the cornbread in the barbecue sauce. And I'll know how to make barbecue sauce. That's a cool skill for the future. I don't know how to make barbecue sauce. I had all the ingredients, and what I'm realizing in retrospect is this is one of the few times in life. Ooh, Alex is back. Should we bite into the cornbread together? Yeah, let's do it. All that. right, hold on. I... We're pausing to eat Mary Hubler's cornbread. Yeah, fair warning. I might have underdone it slightly. Perfect. Let's see. It's a little mushy. It's way underdone. <laughs> but the taste's right there. It's good. So important thing I've learned is... It, no, this is interesting because I, I don't know if this is actually interesting, but in the book, in the recipe, it says put it in the oven for 15 minutes. And I had it in for 15 minutes and looked at it and I was like, it is way underdone. But also I want to be faithful to the Vonnegut recipe, Yep. I, but also I don't want to poison us. I'm going to give it like two more minutes and then take it out. I had the same thought where I was like, I'm going to do exactly what it says no matter what, even if my cooking Ugh. instincts say that it seems wrong. Yeah. And I'm going to bring whatever the result is. So that's yeah. what I was going to do with the barbecue okay, sauce, right? Yeah. So I did everything exactly Ugh. as it said to like a scientific degree. Same. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that, need, that needed like 10 more minutes probably. And it burst really... into flame and became almost instantly. No way. Yeah, like in the pot, flame came up. <laughs> I think like the sugar ignited or something. And it oh, instantly God. became like a sticky, dark, red, tarry mass. Oh, God. And the only thing I can think <laughs> is that I think this might have been the only time in life where it actually did matter that there's a difference between ketchup and ketchup. Oh, is you're there? Supposed to I don't use, really know. Ketchup doesn't have sugar in it. You're supposed to use ketchup. I don't have ketchup. Who the fuck has ketchup? So I use ketchup, which has lots of sugar in it. Yeah. And I think it became like so sugary that it was like super flammable or I don't know. Oh, no. Or like ready to crisp up because you know how sugar will just burn and turn black. Yeah, it's very Creme brulee style. Yeah. yeah. So I like went over the tipping point and it was just like a crusty thing sitting there in front of me at 2 a.m. So the last yeah. thing I did last night was try some. And the first thing I did this morning was throw up a thick red paste. Oh, my God. Really? <laughs> so it didn't come out well, and I didn't bring it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it didn't sit right. No. I tried a spoon of it to be like, well, maybe it tastes like barbecue sauce rock candy. <laughs> I'm a disgusting no, man, that's... Alex. If I make something, I'm going to take a bite. <laughs> no, no. I, I'm just like, because you were like 10 minutes late to tape. I can't believe you're only 10 minutes late. If I threw up in the morning after cooking at one in the morning, I would be like done for the week. Oh, I'd be out. Full disclosure, champ. I debated, but I knew you're I an wasn't. absolute champ. I knew I wasn't really sick. You know that thing where you're like, well, I threw up for an extenuating reason. Right. But I know I'm not sick. It's not germs. Or Let's whatever. rally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're... Also, Vonna Guys is my favorite thing. So. Oh, my. Mine too. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks for the liquid cornbread. It's really soft. Yeah. Uh, on my feet. <laughs> so I, yeah, because I, I was really torn because I was like, I want to be as directly faithful to the recipe to see what happens. Also, I want to give it a little more heat just so it's not too, too disgusting. It's still kind of disgusting because it's not yeah. like cooked. And Vonnegut does say, "Don't try this at home. These recipes are incomplete in the book." So it was always a gamble or like an yeah. experiment to try this. It tastes good, man. 
<laughs> I I think if I fully cooked it, it would be good. It would good. be good, yeah. Yeah, and um, and I also I usually like put a little honey on it or something, ooh, but that yeah. wasn't in the book, so I didn't do it exactly. But like this fully cooked with honey would be good cornbread. And I think like the sauerkraut all the Rudy Waltz and the eggs all the Rudy Waltz both sounded good. I might make those eggs. Yeah, they did sound pretty good. The baked yeah. poached spinach eggs with moths on top. <laughs> and while we're talking food, I'll bring up the only like other recipe related clue I picked up on that I thought was really neat. Which is in the Haitian banana soup recipe, right around the time when he's first bringing up in detail, I'm going to end up living in Haiti and running this hotel. And he says, like, you can tell he's come to love Haiti because he says, like, it's amazing. They're the only culture to ever be a successful slave revolt and, like, stay free. They're the most prolific artists in the world, are Haitians and blah, 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 blah. And then he says, so here's a recipe for Haitian banana soup. And what's notable as an American when you read the recipe is that it's a recipe where you make soup by simmering a bunch of meat and fruit and veggies and stuff. Then you remove the meat and the soup is what's left over. And you use the meat again later to make more soup. And then it's the only recipe that ends with in italics, bon appetit. And I just think it's got to – it's like a sarcastic like – that's how fucking poverty stricken it's the, is there, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. Like it's the only recipe yeah, yeah. in the book where it's like, okay, you're making meat soup. No, you're just flavoring the water. Now remove the meat because you can't afford it. Bon appetit. Right. <laughs> and he Enjoy says like serve six Haitians and it's like a small <laughs> portion. So I just am saying that tipped me off that the recipes mean something. Yeah. That's a good catch. Yeah. Because, yeah, they re- there really is more to it than just you can structure this. Like he, it is a... It's sort of like in, I'm thinking of Cat's Cradle, when they meet Claire Minton on the plane mm-hmm. to the island, and she is a professional indexer, and then you learn all of the island's history through the index of the book of the island's history. Like, I, that's such a cool insight that with this book, you're learning a lot about the world and about stages of Rudy's life through how and why he cooks things. Yeah. Really cool. And the way you interact with the world and perceive the world, like the peephole model, He there's several vignettes that illustrate how, like, the vocabulary you think in, in large part, dictates how the world ends up feeling to you or how life ends up feeling to you, right? Like when his dad does the crazy thing with the apple and scares Celia, he's like, I didn't think it was weird because I had been trained from a young age to think very whimsically. I thought it was really cool. I was like, oh, the fairy king in a enchanted wood has come to visit. Yeah. And it's like, I realized Celia would never even think in those words. Like you could present the same image and she doesn't even have the voca- mental vocabulary yeah. To think of it in that way, she perceives weird, unfamiliar shit happening. I better run away. Like she has no <laughs> socket to put that in. Um, so yeah, language is everything. Yeah, it's absolutely. the language of your thoughts. Speaking of language and its mm. meaning and so on, let's get into a segment called Kurt Blurt. Oh, it's the best. Kurt Blurt. Oh, it's so great. We usually do this sooner. Oh, I do it with my mate. <laughs> You. Sometimes you just gotta rhyme, man. Yeah, it's true. Uh, if what never... was the name of that food segment? Uh, Vana Foods. Oh. Or Kurt Vana Foods. Good, good. I Thanks. like it. Methods <laughs> together. It's all right. <laughs> so, Vana Blurts. Kurt, Kurt, Kurt Food Blurts. in Your Gut? I don't yeah, know. There, there are go. a few ways we could have gone. Kurt uh, in Your Gut. <laughs> Kurt Blurt is a segment where we pick out just our favorite excellent tiny bits of Kurt's writing, little lines and segments and sections and sentences that work for us very, very well because he always nails them. And, you know, when you summarize the plot, sometimes you miss them. I didn't have as many as usual in this book, but there are some that really worked for me. There was one uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier, the way that uh, Dead Eye Dick had a few different meanings in the preface that he talks about. And I liked his line where he says, as it moved through different things, it sort of moved from water to land. And he says... So it is a sort of lungfish of a nickname. It was born in the ocean, but it adapted to life ashore. Uh, that was a really just neat, immediate metaphor for what's going on with it. And also sort of a Galapagos preview when we read that. That's sort of a, a theme in that book. The first one on my list is actually from the reviews. And it just made me realize that it's really funny to summarize Kurt Vonnegut books in a single line. Like Slapstick also was that way. Yeah. Where you're like, oh, it's about a brother and sister who can only be smart when they bone, but it's okay because she dies in an avalanche on Mars. (laughs) This one is, the Houston Chronicle says... This book is so upbeat, you hardly remember it. Contains a death by radioactivity, a double murder, a decapitation, a blizzard that kills hundreds, and the annihilation of a city by a neutron bomb. Yeah. It was relatively cheerful. <laughs> Good review. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I wish I had seen that. That's great. Yeah. 
Yeah, sort of related. Er, early in the first chapter, there's a line Rudy says, which is, that is my principal objection to life, I think. It is too easy, when alive, to make perfectly horrible mistakes. One of the classic Vonnegut lines. It's like the, we must be careful what we, we pretend to be, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, when the Maritimo Mar- or Maritimo brothers or Maritimo brothers or bro theirs are uh, <laughs> literally starving to death because they were, they're like homeless immigrants who just got mugged and they have nothing. Yeah. He says, they could either await death or invent something to do. They invented. Which is like, see, oh. there's people who can have insane tragedy happen to them and bounce right back. Life yeah. is weird that way, yeah. Yeah, and there's, there's hope. ways to combat tragedy. Yeah. There's also one that I like. He's talking about the neutron bomb going off. So here's a big tragedy in the book. And he's talking about how the way the bomb worked, it killed people and it didn't ruin stuff. The, all the buildings were still there. And the line is, since all the property is undamaged, has the world lost anything it loved? Yeah. Is, uh, Kurt picking out how society feels about, you know, don't loot, but if people are dying, right. yeah, whatever. Well, he says, yeah, to wit, my argument is that the United States of America is now ruled evidently by a small clique of power brokers who believe that most Americans are so boring, ungifted, and small-time, they can be slain by the tens of thousands without inspiring any long-term regrets on the part of anyone. Yeah. <laughs> Same message. <laughs> and, the, yeah, the Dark Ages, they haven't ended yet. <laughs> he talks about everyone's life having an end point, and then if you live longer than that, your life can feel like epilogue. Yeah. And he says, Oh, yeah, that's an amazing story. It comes to different points, but the problem with his parents is they're two people whose stories ended very, very early and then they lived way longer. He says, Mother's story, for example, ended when she married the handsomest rich man in town. Because if you're told that's your only goal and then you achieve it at 14, you're done. Like your life sucks now. (laughs) And it really, like, she just says nothing to do in the whole book. But I don't think it's a Vana what? It's intentional. It's like, look what we do to women sometimes. Yeah, it's solid sketching of a character who's based on real people. There are people like that, yeah. es- especially a little bit further back in the day when women had less rights. <laughs> yeah. Life is not over, but the story is. And it may be even worse for nations to think they are characters in stories. Yeah. Yeah, buy that. <laughs> I, think I, I think I only have three more. I've I'm spent this whole tight. time deleting, and I still have a lot, but let's do our old yeah, rapid I'll do fire. A couple. Cool. Yeah. This is, it spoke to me because I was a tall, skinny kid. I'm a tall and relatively skinny person to this oh, day. Uh, yeah, it's fun. And uh, Rudy is talking about how when he was a kid, he grew up before he grew out in a very pronounced way. And he's about to handle guns, so it's sort of a scary, like, physical thing. But he's talking about how he got really, really tall all of a sudden, and his line is, I may have been trying to evolve into a Superman and then gave it up in the face of community disapproval. Good. Glad you got that. I deleted that one. <laughs> it's so good. It's a great joke about all of us dudes who had a giant growth spurt in like 7th grade. Like, look yeah. at me, man. Like, look at me. I yeah. gained a foot and then no more feet. Yeah. What? What yeah. happened? Yeah. Uh, this is George Metzger. Uh, I'm glad Vonnegut made him the editor of the paper because then not only does he have a really beautiful scene with the police where it's a play and he's trying to prevent them from hurting the kid anymore he also writes up a statement in the paper the next day because it's the biggest news in town and he's the person to speak to it and he writes a really pretty editorial oh good i can delete this one too my favorite (laughs) bit is he says we cannot get rid of mankind's fleetingly wicked wishes we can get rid of the machines that make them come true line break i give you a holy word disarm it's disarm in all caps. Oh, okay. That's I can it. delete it because the part I liked was the other half of that. Oh. We're, we're out of the no pocket way. a little on this one. Yeah. I, the paragraph right before the one Alex just read is, I think, equally beautiful. My wife has been killed by a machine which should never have come into the hands of any human being. It is called a firearm. It makes the blackest of all human wishes come true at once, at a distance, that something die. Yeah. Just gave me the vision of like, yeah, everyone has sometimes been like, I hate that person's guts. Guns are the thing that make it like, well, we could hook that up for you right now. Like, yeah. don't think about it further. This person could be dead a second from now. Right. That's that's a dangerous power to have. <laughs> yeah. A gun like talking like, I don't like guts. <laughs> yeah, <so>, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> All right. So shall I rapid fire? Yeah, I only have one more. Oh, okay, you do it. But uh, Please. At the beginning, he talks about there are four real-life artists in the book. One is Hitler. The other three come up mostly at the end of the book. But there's one uh, named Frank Duvendeck, and Rudy is going through the journal of Duvendeck after Duvendeck's death because Duvendeck met Otto, Rudy's father, and talked about him and really didn't like him. And what Duvendeck wrote about Otto is he said, Otto Waltz should be shot. 
He should be shot for seeming to prove the last thing that needs to be proved in this part of the world, that an artist is a person of no consequence. The American Midwest being that part of the world, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not for people getting shot necessarily, no, but, but it was an like, interesting statement of like, if like you're gonna this move, is the worst person to If name. you're going to move to Ohio and be the most famous artist in town, give artists a good name. Like, be yeah. decent at least. You suck! Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, people who want to say art is just for rich assholes look at you and it's true. Like, stop yeah. doing that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. So as our in-house obsessive blurtsman, it's great. And uh, champion of this book, I did find more lines choice, and I will guide you through them at breakneck speed. Now, father thought the guns beautiful, but they may as well have been copperheads and rattlesnakes. They were murder. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. That Next. is good. They wouldn't dare stock St. Elmo's Remedy, of course. It was so bad for people, talking about a modern-day pharmacy versus the thing that made his family rich. Yeah. Sorry, I guess there's a little more context. At the pharmacy he now works, they have a poster for St. Elmo's Remedy as like an antique jokey thing to just have on the wall. Right. St. Like, Elmo's Remedy being the opium shit that his parents used to, or his yeah. great ancestors sold. But it's, it's like a yeah. Cracker Barrel restaurant decoration. Yeah. Like, it's just old stuff. So he says, the know. poster is just a joke. Yeah. But... Next to that, they have a modern prescription counter where you can get your barbiturates and amphetamines and methaquilones and so on. (laughs) Science marches on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) When she is frightened by the whole to-do on prom night, Celia's speech is, she told us she would like to claw away her face so that people would stop seeing things in it that had nothing to do with what she was like inside. She was ready to die at any time because what men and boys thought about her and tried to do to her made her so ashamed. One of the first things she was going to do when she got to heaven, she said, was to ask somebody what was written on her face and why it had been put there. Yeah. Hard, it's hard for the beautiful people. <laughs> oh, we did that one. I was a great marksman if I aimed at nothing. Nothing's what I would hit. <laughs> um, when he's locked up and everyone's yelling at him is a great vignette of like how mob mentality works. Everybody was happy. Everybody could feel safe for a while. Bad luck was caged. There was bad luck cringing on the bench in there, which is him. Yeah. Just got to give props to Haiti. Haiti as a nation was born out of the only successful slave revolt in all of human history. Imagine that. In no, and this is mind-blowing, in no other instance in the history of the world have slaves overwhelmed their masters, governed themselves, and begun to deal with other nations, and, I think the crucial part, been able to repel foreigners who feel that natural law dictates that they must become slaves again. So, like, good job, Haiti. I mean, just really hanging in there. And that is, and that is the way the way I was glad that Haiti got brought into the book because I think it's sort of like Sacco and Vanzetti underpins a lot of Jailbird and mm-hmm. it's an actual real piece of history that not everybody knows. Like I think he feels Haiti is the piece of history worth putting into this in book. In this book, yeah. So that's why he puts the exploitative white guys there. But it's like you know, it's very interesting the history of that country. Yeah. yeah. Felix describing to his soon to be ex wife, the brother, she goes, I think he might be an idiot savant. What's an idiot savant? You know, someone who's stupid in every possible way, but, like, they can play the piano. No, he can't be that. He doesn't play the piano. (laughs) (laughs) That's not what he meant. Thinking about when he meditates, the only time in the book he really meditates on the woman he killed, uh, what he says by way of, like, apologizing to us is he says, they could be so busy now. I like that. Yeah. He's like, I wonder what that fetus would be doing. He could be so busy now instead of being a wisp of undifferentiated nothingness. Yeah. This is just great as far as, like, really gets you into the head of someone whose life is defined by one event. The Taj Mahal was completed in 1643, 301 years before I shot Eloise Metzger. I just love the (laughs) subtle, like, that is how he records time. Oh, yeah. It revolves around the day he shot Eloise Metzger. You know what I mean? Probably the pull-out quote your English teacher will pull for you. I identified a basic mistake my parents had made about life. They thought that it would be very wrong if anybody ever laughed at them. (laughs) I liked that. Man, how did I miss some of these? They're like, good, in man. Terms of tra- you know, this is the them. kind of thing that appeals to me, but it's not that genius. It's just hella depressing. <laughs> not even the minister at Celia's funeral thought that every life had a meaning and that every death could startle us into learning something important and so on. He thought the corpse was a mediocrity that had broken down after a while. The mourners were mediocrities who would break down after a while. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he's thinking while he does the eulogy for Celia. Yeah. Rough. Sort of like an Eleanor Rigby vibe. (laughs) Uh, And in the same scene, he's trying to give it a more positive spin. Celia in her casket there, all shot through with Drano and amphetamine, might have been a dead cell sloughed off by a pancreas the size of a Milky Way. Of course, the planet itself was now breaking down. It was going to blow itself up sooner or later. In a manner of speaking, it was already eating Drano. 
Mm. Fuck. I think a great double entendre in the scene with Dwayne and Felix chatting is he sees that Felix is sobbing, but the first thing he says when he walks up is he points to a dent in his car because he also just drove under the influence and crashed into something with blue paint. Yeah. And he says, you look like you scraped up against something blue. Isn't that a great phrase for like you look sad? Oh. You scraped up against something blue. I love that. Yeah, I didn't catch that. I feel like it's a double double, entendre. But I think it is, yeah. Two more. Beauty seldom comes cheap which is not like a notable line, but I think it's there for a reason. And it's, it comes at the end of him describing the Taj Mahal. He says, hundreds of people died building the Taj Mahal, but beauty seldom comes cheap. And I think it's a pull out of like, oh, yeah. that's the hint. If you need like, this is the moral of the story. There's a few morals, but that's one of the big ones. <laughs> and it's inspired by a death too, the Taj Mahal. Yeah. Right? It's, that's and, the whole reason. Uh, yeah, for his dead wife, right. Yeah. And it's like, If you expect to have the moments that are truly beautiful in life, you need to stick around. And if you stick around, there's going to be bad shit, too. Yeah. You just hang in there. It's going to go up and down. Like, you know, beauty seldom comes cheap. And then the last thing I'll mention, because it was the biggest gut punch to me of all, you know, not as depressing as Breakfast, but in a pretty downery book, it like, I cried. Hmm. I'll just say, I cried. Is the realization, because it got me, in the scene... It's also written as a playlet when Celia is malingering with the gold pieces for pills because she's all ugly and deformed now for being on meth her whole life. She's like pockmarked and he doesn't recognize her. And then she reveals she's Celia by saying lines from his play. And it feels so hard like they're going towards a touching human moment where these people who both have had a really hard go reminisce about this beautiful time and she does start to reminisce about how great it was to do the play and then she is like so it would be like so great if we could do a little play where you give me amphetamines (laughs) and (laughs) that turn destroyed me because like i thought it was going to be a love moment and the line is the across the page rudy and then in parentheses emptily and then just the word pills yeah like he's just going he's just calling out oh that's oh I see. (laughs) It's like really upsetting. And then uh, when she says, I'll give you gold pieces, I love in the narration, he goes, like a prospector would, it says, gold, gold, gold. (laughs) I just think to underscore how like at that moment, it's the last thing he cares about. Like he doesn't give a shit about gold. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Or it's weird to be valuing that at that time in his life. Well, it's also, I like She's got gold. (laughs) Because in Kurt's actual plays or or unperformed plays, he does like jokey stage directions a lot. I I like that he did that in this too. Yeah, and one is like, she drops gold on the floor. Gold, gold, gold. I think he's just like, this is how you are, you stupid Americans, right? Gold. (laughs) You love gold, you fucking idiots. (laughs) You mopes. Yeah, so that's all my downer blurts. Those are great. Yeah. And we can also, as we're pulling things out of the book, let's go to, we only have a few more segments left, but one of them is a key segment called Vana What? Oh. Vana What? I didn't know we were doing it this time. Vana What? Do you have some? So I don't know particularly, because you'd uh, emailed in advance. You said, hey, we can probably skip yeah. or not spend time on this segment. And I, I think I pretty much agree, because uh, there are elements of things that could be Vanawati to me, but I felt like they were all to less of a degree than they are in Breakfast of Champions. And what they were all owned by the character that felt that way. It yeah. didn't seem like it was coming out of Vonnegut. Yeah. He and so- made much more effort. Like, he even did in the preface. He's like, look, this guy's going to do that thing where he says, like, Don't you star el bathroomo, mi amigo? But he's like, I don't think that. The guy is just doing that. That's (laughs) the character. So, like, everything that was problematic was very much owned by the characters. Yeah. And he comes out very hard and eloquently about sexism, racism. He's like... Left and right, he's throwing out like, and fuck this form of oppression, and fuck that form of oppression. So I was yeah. just really not offended. Me too. And oh, so, well, and, and it's also cool that I feel like a lot of times when fans or just people are uh, offended by a piece of art or complaining about a piece of art or angry about an element of a piece of art, they're just. I feel like they're usually just kind of shouting into the void, and it'll it won't reach mm-hmm. the creator. But I think uh, this book is a sign of Kurt Vonnegut like keeping track of either people's reaction to his work or keeping track of the world in general. And growing. Right. I mean, you can literally yeah, track. Yeah. I mean, and it's, I don't even mean to lump all black people together as the other, but clearly in an unexamined way they are to Kurt or yeah. what have been and to us all white guys. Uh, or at least he's recognizing that in the country they are to an extent. But my point is yeah. like you can track the group of black people who live a rustic lifestyle as depicted in Sirens of Titan. Oh boy. Then as depicted in Cat's Cradle. 
Yeah. And then as depicted in this with the Haitians, and I, I think it helps that he visited by Afrin between probably, the sure. Haitians are by far the most, they just seem normal. Yeah. It's a functioning society. Whereas even if you go back to Cat's Cradle, you're like, the natives are a little like cartoony. It's a weird yeah. fictional, everyone here is very simple and naive, you know, in that way. Wink, wink, like problematic wink. And then if yeah. you go back to Sirens, he, it's just like they crash landed in the jungle. Some cannibals tried to cook them in a pot with bones in their hair, but they escaped. And you're like, "Geez, dude." Yeah, for real. And and within, so he's grown. Within not a crazy amount of time, he has a society in a tropical yeah. place that's completely put together and, and it's, normal. And instead of making up something, yeah. he chose a real society. He talks about the real history of it. And yeah. I'll heavily encourage you. He mentioned, and I'm like, really? He was like, uh, Haitians also produce the most dance, art, and music of any culture. I'm like, I don't even know how you quantify that, first of all. Right. But is that true? <laughs> so, yeah. dude, check out. Like, you can fall in a great Wikipedia hole looking up famous Haitian artists, Haitian art, Haitian music, Haitian dance. Cool. I did for several hours. Beautiful stuff. Oh, <laughs> they that's do. Really cool. They pump out a lot of amazing art. Oh, I didn't know. Fall down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Well, that's great. So, that's, this is a very uh, uh, exciting one. Really nice happy Vana for Vana Watts. Yeah. yeah. And from there, let's go into another uh, key segment called. Kurt Von Grades. This segment is key. <laughs> and this one is a segment we do every episode where we, mm-hmm. uh, as Kurt Vonnegut did in the book Palm Sunday, he graded himself relative to himself. So we do a grade two. And this is uncharted territory for us because is the, this is the first book after Palm Sunday. So his Palm Sunday lists, he didn't grade this book ever. Mm. In life, he did an interview in 1983 where he goes out of his way, uh, kind of without anybody asking to him to to give this book a letter grade. <gasps> He's like, eh, uh, the people book... expect it from me. It's kind of my thing. Yeah, the book came out <laughs> in 82, so he was talking about it in 83, and he gave it a B minus. He said a B minus relative to his other work, which is, you know, it's, it's what a B minus is. It's kind of in the middle. It's the same grade he gave Monkey House. It's slightly below player piano, which I would disagree with. And then it's above Breakfast of Champions, interestingly, even though it's kind of a sequel to it. And above Wampier's Foam and Grand Balloons and Palm Sunday. I don't like every Kurt book. I'm not just a shill up here, but I gotta yeah. say, A plus. <laughs> All right. And it's it's joined, it's rejoined me in the pantheon of like, I think I said Sirens of Titan was A triple plus. Breakfast is yeah. A double plus, and this is an A plus. So this is this is all top tier stuff if you're me. Yeah, I think according to my tracking doc, you gave Breakfast of Champions Infinity Symbol Gold Star. Oh, <laughs> also good. Which yeah. is off the ranch. I was really moved. I was in a weird place at that time in my life, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't recognize letters. <laughs> this has been a very fun one for me because in the process of doing the episode with you, it's risen in my estimation. <gasps> I like get yeah, it more. Interesting. It's, it's a really phenomenal book. I think I would give it, I, I think I would still give it like a B plus. Sure. Uh, I don't know if it's Room quite, to grow. Which is good. Like, that's a very good book. Yes. And it has a lot to it, and it's well done. I still, I mean, Breakfast of Champions blows me away, and it isn't quite on the level of that, but he's doing a lot of things he did well there. And then, like, I gave, uh, I'm looking at my own things to make it relative. I gave uh, God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater a B plus. Mm-hmm. I think it's, it's probably around there. It's, okay. You know, it's uh, around yeah. that very good level. Yeah. Yeah. He overrates player piano. <laughs> he really does. It's kind of strange. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably it's probably the further the back furthest it goes out in of history. Yeah. It's, yeah. What do you do? But yeah. So those are our Vana grades. Yeah. They and average out we... to a healthy uh, A minus. Good job, Kurt. Yeah. <laughs> made the honor roll. Yeah. Speaking of books and uh, that exist in the world, let's go to a segment called related reading. Trying to remember the actual theme song now and see if it syncs up perfectly. <laughs> oh. oh, the I'm one we used? I'm singing what in my brain <laughs> I remember the loop to be that will later in post be placed over this. Uh, so it'll be hilarious because it's just going to be an unrelated song. <laughs> it's going to totally clash. <laughs> right, like they're in, it's a weird minor key thing yeah. going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. What if it's perfect three-part harmony somehow? Oh, God. You're like a beach boy. I know. This is a segment, if you haven't heard the show, where we find just other books and texts and other movies and things that remind us of the work. And I think I have two. I control myself for once. I have two as well. (laughs) Oh, now look at us. Look at us. Um, Please look at us. (laughs) We need it. (laughs) Audio is not enough. One, uh, One that jumped out for me, it's a novel called Look Homeward Angel. It's by a writer named Thomas Wolfe. 
who uh, mm-hmm. is from. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Well, and he's also not the writer Tom Wolf. They're different people. Oh, Thomas uh, Wolf. Playful Howl retracted. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Wolf was from, I believe, specifically from Asheville, North Carolina. And Look Homeward Angel is, in a lot of ways, adapting his childhood and his growth into a young man. It also super jumped out to me because it opens with. It's opening is probably the most famous passage, and it's it goes like a stone, a leaf, an unturned door, and then it goes into a long. Oh yeah, I heard that. Yeah, and, it, and I have heard that before. Yeah, and it goes into a long just meditation on what it is like to be born into the world, like uh. the shock of it and the difficulty of it, and how hard it is. And then from there, the character goes through a lot of struggle based on a few key mistakes and decisions in his life. And so it's, it's, it pretty neatly lines up with the totally. people aspect of Zed I Dick and also how autobiographical that book is, I think. And, yeah. it, and it's a great piece of writing. It's and really people good. haunted by very key mistakes they made. Yeah. Yeah, totally. But it, it's probably one of the greatest works of fiction from North Carolina. So if you're out there, you know, check it out. Well, this one's just a spiritual cousin, but if you are not familiar, I highly recommend the very cheesy poetry of Ogden Nash. And I'm not going to recommend a particular... Oh, you don't even know the name? Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Well, he wrote thousands and thousands of short poems that are inarguably, like, not sophisticated, but things like (laughs) the cow is of the bovine ilk, one end is moo, the other milk. Or the one about ants running around all the time is, well, would you be calm and placid if you were filled with formic acid? (laughs) Um, So he's like a Dr. Seussian type of guy. Yeah. And he did a series of, like, he wanted to do a poem about every animal that ever existed. But he's, he's just a poet. I recommend all his stuff. It's really funny. It's got, like, a weird owl vibe if you like, like, big, broad, cheesy, but well-executed, friendly comedy. <laughs> and uh, and it reminded me of, I don't know, just the whole time I was reading this one, I wanted to talk to Kurt about Ogden Nash. I was like, I bet he likes Ogden Nash. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, he, as, you know, he Especially any wordplay or, like, anything that would be considered just jokey or low comic. Yeah. yeah he loves it. He had a great and limerick so in this one that I think he wrote about the guy who fucked a monkey and made a baby with three balls and purple hair. You don't remember? Felix don't, says it. Oh, uh, yeah, I think it comes out. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. I'm not going to remember it, so let's it. move on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My other one is, uh, it's you might have seen it or know it, uh, it's the TV show Better Call Saul. Uh, oh, boy. I, I'm a massive fan of Breaking Bad, and I think Better Call Saul is about on its level, and it is a, the rare, like, prequel also kind of sequel that draws side characters from the previous work into their own thing that's its own force but also breaking bad is so perfectly plotted in terms of like every i feel like every character does things that make sense based on things that just happened which is real rare in tv and uh better call Saul keeps it up and it's just a great piece of work on its own also it's a great example of kind of continuing a fictional world into its own whole new thing And also in us talking about justice being so key to Dead Eye Dick, like justice is the one of the driving forces of Better Call Saul. It's all about like a shitty lawyer. (laughs) And a man who you realize not in Breaking Bad, but in Better Call Saul was a good hearted man at some point. Yeah. Because when you see him in Better Call Saul, sorry, or Breaking Bad, it's too late, right? But um, yeah, it's it's a long running tragedy like Breaking Bad is. But in this one, it's much more about the justice and injustice of society getting somebody. And less focused. Focused on who's going to shoot who, will they get blown up? Yeah. I, I yeah. Which for a second I was like, this isn't thrilling me like Breaking Bad. But then I quickly realized, oh, it's a different show. Yeah, it's That's different. equally good. Yeah. yeah. Just because there's not meth in it. It's still good. <laughs> yeah. An Ogden Nash poem. I looked, up, I looked up the most famous ones just in case. This okay. is called Fleas. Adam had them. That's the end. <laughs> so that's like, you oh, get it. That's so you know great. what Ogden Nash is like. Oh, he'd, he'd love them. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure he did. And then my second recommendation this time, similar vibe, someone who could attack, who usually did attack the darkest themes possible in the light, at heart, most lighthearted way possible, James Thurber. Oh, Are you a yeah. Thurber fan? I feel like I looked up that name recently. Does he come up in this book? Did he? Maybe. That's why I wrote it down. But yeah. I think I I particularly want to recommend a quote-unquote children's book, but it's actually about the end of the world and mortality, so I don't know. Cool. You know what I mean? It's like feels like a children's book, but it's about serious issues yeah. called The Last Flower. Everyone should read The Last Flower by James Thurber, who wrote and drew it, and it rules. That's all. 
Great. It's about the last flower in the world. <laughs> well, I mean, a- yeah. anything apocalypse that's also for exactly. the young. Exactly. That's also Kurt. funny for the young is very yeah. Kurt. Cool. The synopsis on Wikipedia is, after World War XII, civilization has collapsed. <laughs> all the groves and gardens are destroyed, dogs have run away, and in all the world there is no trace of love. Suddenly, one day, a young girl comes across something she does not recognize, a flower. Oh. Good children's book. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, oh, that sounds really good. <laughs> yeah. And Thurber's always great. He's done a ton of great stuff. Yeah. Oh, that was a, that was a, that was a fun section. Yeah. I like this. Let's go into the next segment, which is Vonnegut News. Most consistent Oh, now a bass line. Oost, oost, Perfect. Well, if you're covering the deets, someone's got to get the bass. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm glad you did. This is the segment <laughs> where we uh, we talk about things going on in the Vonnegut world. And uh, we also didn't do this segment on our previous live episode because it was live. And like, why would we do that? You know, it doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we have a lot of Vonnegut news to catch up on because it's oh. been a productive uh, time for that. Dan Harmon, who is the guy who made uh, Community and makes Rick and Morty and has done many other TV and film things. And while I have the opportunity, I have to say most importantly to me, writer, creator of the comic Lacosa Nostroid, look it up. Whoa. When he was living in Milwaukee still and had no Hollywood career whatsoever, he made uh, an amazing comic book called Lacosa Nostroid that's almost impossible to find now, but it fucking rules. (laughs) Is it a a mafia thing? It is about a future where the robot android mafia family <laughs> Great. fly around in giant Voltron like robots uh, enforcing the mafias to, it's like Voltron meets the Godfather it's fucking amazing that sounds so good <laughs> yeah and it's like how has no major movie even ripped off that concept it's like a 50-50 mashup of gangster movie plus giant robot movie and it rules right Godfather <laughs> and Transformers yeah, yeah right the, the and, two uh, most successful movies you knew, ever you could already reasons. tell what he wanted to do with his life because in the o- the first page it would say <laughs> here's the score for this comic this issue like what song will be playing on each page here's oh. who should provide the voice of each character once this becomes a movie like That's he cast awesome. it in the cover of each issue. The kind of, it's oh, dope. He yeah. does movie time. That's yeah, great. yeah. <laughs> well, I am now a little bit unhappy that he'll be too busy to make that just yet because sure. he's going to be adapting the Sirens of Titan for television. <gasps> I know. It just came out uh, when we're taping this week or the previous week. Yeah, it's the very news recent. came out this week or last yeah. week, yeah. And uh, that's just very exciting news. My my favorite person to adapt it would be Michael Swim, but also Dan Harmon's oh, pretty cool. You. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, and look for that. It's, you know, in the future, but very yeah. exciting. He's an all-time hero, so can't wait for that. Yeah. I um, hope Royland is involved. Do you know? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I think the story said it was Harmon, and I think I think the name is Evan Katz. I think that's his other main collaborator. Sure. I don't know. Cool. I think Roiland's doing a lot of, like, VR stuff in addition to yeah. Rick and Morty. Follow Justin Roiland on Twitter, even if you don't even know Rick and Morty. Yeah. Because he also he is heavily involved in pumping out really innovative indie games that are awesome. Yeah. If you're into that. And also, and get to know Rick and Morty. The third season's out, like, right when this will come out. Yeah, I don't so know what we're do doing, that. but you should watch Rick and Morty and read La Cosa Nostra. We're <laughs> yeah, really, like, off focus, but I agree. <laughs> <laughs> we just like that over a lot. Yeah. And also, uh, in other adaptation of Vonnegut News, uh, there was a musical of God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, uh, originally by Mencken and Ashman, and then they did a revival of it recently. And the cast album of that comes out July 28th. So when we're taping, we haven't heard it yet, but you in the future, you can go get it right now. You can go get the cast album of a musical, and it's the first cast album of it, this revival. So it's, uh, in for most people, music they've never heard before. Wow. Yeah. I've got a new Bone Jams mix, man. <laughs> Jennifer, when I get home tonight, I, that's oh what boy. we're playing. <laughs> I mean, you can just like music without... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought music was that thing that you make love to. Oh, no, there's a whole nother. Oh, my God. Yeah, you can play it in elevators and at stores and, and just in your car. I have to go <laughs> <laughs> and spend the rest of my life catching up. <laughs> yeah, but I'm looking forward to that, especially uh, James Earl Jones is Kilgore Trout in it. I don't know what his singing is ah, like. It's going to be crazy. Awesome. Yeah, that's a good you know? pick. Who knows? Um, Do you know any other cast right now? A guy, I, I don't know Broadway well enough, but a guy named right. Santino Fontana is Rosewater. Okay. And uh, apparently that's a big deal. I, I don't know Great Broadway name. very well. Yeah. <laughs> and then other people in the cast, Clark Johnson, Jeff Blumenkrantz, 
and uh, others from there. But And it's also music by Alan Menken and Howard Ashman, who right. did a bunch of your favorite Disney movies and also just other great musicals from yeah. there. Yeah, arguably, certainly yeah. in the conversation for best musical writers of all time. Yeah, there's, al- there's almost no way the album's bad. It's probably right, pretty right, good. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> And then uh, what else is going on? I well, this is this is very just personal almost. But we did uh, we do a show called the Cracked Stand Up Show at Nerd Melt monthly on the third Thursday of the month. And uh, someone who came to it named Adriana, she said that she saw the play of Mother Night in San Francisco and that it was real real good. That play uh, closed. You can't go see it anymore. But uh, that's the first like in person review of it I've heard. Yeah. And so that was very exciting. Apparently they're doing good dramatic work in San Francisco. And then also, there's one other thing. There is, a, if you're an Amazon.com user, I don't know if you are, there is an official portal to the like official Vonnegut store on it, which has a ton of T-shirts and also other merch and his books. And so, nice. I don't know, if you're just looking for Vonnegut gifts or whatever, yeah. that's probably a place to go. That's awesome. Yeah. I'll it's be all on organized. that. I didn't know about that. Yeah. But that's, uh, yeah, so that's uh, about all the news going on. But a lot of that Harmon project is particularly exciting. Of and course. also, you future people get to hear the music, <laughs> and I don't. Yeah, uh, exactly. Jealous. But yeah, I think that I think that just about wraps up our time with Dead Eye Dick. I think so. I'm going to be sad to have less of an excuse to use dick all the time in my normal speaking, like course of speaking, <laughs> but... I'll find a way. Life finds a way. Right, right. Dicks find a way. Like your calendar event for today, like yeah. dicking, you know? Yeah, it's... yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I said dicking it up with Alex, getting my dick on, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you broke it into like well, seven for seconds. For the last two weeks, to... whenever people ask what I'm doing, I can just say dicking, and it, it's getting true. Getting ready to dick. I never get to, to say that anymore, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, now you'll get to say a couple other words, because our next book is going to be... <laughs> it wasn't a very elegant way into that. Uh, our next book is going to be another Vonnegut novel. It's in 1985. He wrote a book called Galapagos. And I remember liking this book quite a bit when I read it before, but it'll be... That will be harder to see him into my normal conversation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) And we do, we have a run of novels for a bit, because then after that is his 1987 novel, Bluebeard. But next up is going to be Galapagos. So if you read along with us, check it out. And if you don't read along with us, hey, keep it up. It's fun for everybody. It's meant for everybody. But yeah, and this has been very, very fun. I especially, I, I really, really did enjoy like appreciating the book more in talking to you about it. That's totally. really nice for me. If this is not what is fun, then what is fun is not is nice. this at all. But it's nice. Is so it yeah. so goes it. So goes it. <laughs> Bye everyone. <laughs> <laughs>